So I guess I should have uh, clicked the go live button, hey? That would have helped. But anyways, I guess we'll redo my whole intro again that I uh, spoke into air over, which is great. But hello, guys. Hopefully you can all hear me and all that fun shit. Hopefully my audio levels are good. Uh, everything on OBS is reading out okay. So I guess I'll do the last two minutes over again because I'm an idiot and couldn't click the live button. Uh, that one's on me. Just wait for the comments to roll in here to see that everything's okay. And we shall see if everything's kosher. It's a bit of a pain in the ass to set up. Usually with gaming streams, uh, everything's okay. Uh, but this is kind of a hodgepodge of making sure Microsoft Edge can be seen and making sure there's, you know, a somewhat pretty background. But anyway, to guys, get you guys all cut up, tonight we'll, we will be reading Jason Jacoby's Hidden Yet Not Hidden blog. Uh, if you're new to this whole thing or you're just wondering what the fuck's going on, uh, the last year and a half there was an iRacing streamer who went off the deep end, whether it be due to mental illness or just something's not quite right with this guy. Uh... The last year and a half, he went from being just this kind of annoying, cringy iRacing streamer that was kind of off in his own corner to someone who's gotten himself in a ton of trouble. Uh, he's been arrested multiple times for uh, beating his, his ex-girlfriend, for stalking her. Uh, he's uh, been in and out of jail. Uh, he's got various bond conditions that now prevent him from posting on YouTube. And within the past five years, all the goodwill he's kind of earned within the sim racing community is just being some guy who was a bit of a veteran. Uh, he used to race with, like, Dale Jr. and Denny Hamlin. Uh, that's all kind of been washed away because it turns out this guy was either covering up a diagnosis of schizophrenia and it's all just come out now. Or the guy was a massive sociopath and uh, we're now just seeing his true colors because there's less and less people that want to cover for him. So what we're going to be doing tonight is going through his private yet not so private blog. So basically Jason's been, uh, he's had a ton of different platforms to uh, post just stuff on his various social media. He had a Facebook fan page, he had an official website, he had a Twitter, uh, he had a couple of YouTube channels. And all of these, because of his erratic behavior and because he's been making threats to like his middle school teacher and he's been making, you know, crazy postings about Dale Jr. and postings about me and postings about his ex-girlfriend... Uh, he's slowly been reduced into what he can post on. So his YouTube videos have stopped, his website posts have stopped, he's, I don't think he has his Facebook page anymore, he's not on Twitter anymore, uh, or so we thought. So on Jason's official website, which is still up, it's just racingjasonjacoby.com, there is a hidden web page where Jason is actually continuing to post uh, on his blog on a daily basis, if not two or three times a day. Uh, from what I understand, he's actually not supposed to be doing this, uh, I guess there's, in his bond conditions, he's not supposed to be posting anywhere on social media, so whether his personal blog constitutes a social media, it's tough to know what that's going to be considered, but the way I interpret it, he's not actually supposed to be doing this. But he essentially has a hidden part of his website that he continues to post daily on. Now, because my personal life has been affected by this guy, uh, I've been the unlucky bastard who's had to document everything. Uh, anytime you deal with a cyber stalker to any degree, what ends up happening is the cops and all the uh, the online guides say is to, to really document everything and get to understand who this person is. So when you have to go report things to the police or get law enforcement involved or go after a guy civilly, you have everything. So unfortunately, at some point this summer, I did read through every single one of his blog posts at length, categorize them, save them, uh, take notes on what was in them so I could kind of understand like what kind of asshole we're dealing with here. So what that has resulted in is now I essentially have a list of what I believe to be the top 18 uh, craziest posts that this guy has made on his personal blog. Uh, Wade Sturfer, if you just want a quick repeat, uh, Jason was arrested, I believe, last year for battery of his ex-girlfriend, and then I believe this year for stalking her. It was aggravated stalking. So aggravated stalking is a charge that comes with violating bond conditions. So let's say he gets arrested and one of the, the bond conditions is to stay away from his ex-girlfriend, don't post about her on YouTube, don't do anything like that. Uh, aggravating, aggravated stalking is a charge that comes with violating that. So the bond condition says don't post about her on social media. And he did. He made a bunch of YouTube videos on her saying his lawyer had quit on him and that he's got to tell his story and that she was a piece of shit, which she wasn't. 
uh, and it's just a mess. Uh, Mr. RJ Bansma, iRacing hasn't banned him because, uh, from what I understand, when we spoke about this to iRacing or around this time last summer, iRacing didn't want to set a precedent and say that what goes on in someone's personal life is uh, is grounds for being uh, punted off the iRacing servers, uh, which goes against stuff in their sporting code. There's a very specific rule that says you're supposed to respect sim racers on and off the track, uh, and Jacoby could get could have easily been tossed like within days of all this stuff first breaking last summer based on that sporting code stipulation alone, but for whatever reason, they just didn't and didn't want to set that precedent. So it's resulted in a can of worms, and we really don't know how many people he's like harassed or stalked or just been an asshole to on the game, which is kind of terrifying, especially because there's a bunch of like little kids on there. Like, it's one thing for me to be 28 and living, you know, 3,000k from this guy. It's a bit worrying when you consider that they're like young teenagers who are just getting into all these games and like thinking they're kind of cool, and there's some creep in Georgia who's like gonna lure him to his Discord and like. Uh, what'd somebody say about him? He wanted, he tried to like offer cash incentives for him to like come over and have a sleepover with him. It, it's just weird and very disturbing. So like I said, because this guy's affected my personal life and, and fucked up my employment and all that shit, I've been advised, you know, document everything. And that's resulted with me essentially having a giant chunk of my hard drive dedicated to just like things this guy has done that might help out my case or just kind of prove that he's unstable. And I was able to go through that rather quickly tonight and find 18 of the wildest blog posts that he's hidden on his website. Again, if you're just joining in or you're, you you kind of joined a couple minutes into the intro, Jason Jacoby's website doesn't have a blog that's easily accessible. Uh, it's actually hidden on the site by typing in raceandjasonjacoby.com forward slash blog. So I'm going to head there now just to show you uh, what this is. So again, it is literally a hidden segment of his website where he continues to post daily uh, just his random thoughts and how he feels about certain things and uh, if you've been following any of the, the Chris Chan stuff over the past couple of months this is very much like Chris Chan's captain's log where it is just a wild mess of someone who really shouldn't have access to the internet in my opinion typing his innermost thoughts and they are just completely wild so I've got 18 of his wildest blog posts set aside here on a notepad and generally what what they uh, they all entail. And they're really separated into, I guess, three distinct chunks. Uh, the first third we're going to go through are his uh, some of his iRacing or racing or sim racing related posts. Uh, then there's essentially a Dale Earnhardt Jr. saga where he is obsessed with Dale Earnhardt Jr., and there is a final third of these blog posts where uh, it's essentially called, I've labeled it as schizo nonsense appropriately. Uh, and it's just wild shit that I found reading through his blog. And again, one of the reasons I'm making this YouTube video is because I've tried to steer people to this guy's blog and been like, hey, you need to read this because like this is actually really concerning what this guy's writing. And because there was just so much shit written on it, and so many of his posts are literal schizo nonsense that they go, oh, well, he's just he's uh, he's just into scripture, that's all. I'm sitting here saying, no, if you actually really do take the time and go through all of his posts because you have nothing better to do, uh, it is completely wild what I've stumbled upon and what we're going to read through today. So we're going to start with a post uh, that he's entitled, and these are not in chronological, uh, chronological order. They're just based on what I thought would be interesting. So this post was written... Uh, on October 14th, 2020, so last year in the fall. And this one's called Hearts Set Upon Unjust Gain, uh, Many Will Come in My Name. So this is the first blog post I want to show you guys. Uh, and it actually talks about how Jason believes the entire sim racing community has been after him since 2004, which is an interesting stance. So he writes, Their many phrases have been widely misused because compliments are a great thing. Brown nosing, kissing up, etc., it's unfortunate that those who are genuine and sincere are shot down when they compliment, because usually the ones who seek unjust gain with their praise who receive the accolades. Unjust gain is when people seek to abuse power obtained through praise. Think of those who do wretched things to celebrities. I'll delve into the wretched things done to me, quoting Jesus with, Many will come in my name. So he writes, Fake accounts and words I never spoke. He says, Since I began sim racing in 2004, I've had people fake my screen name and steal my IP address. I was banned from racing servers I'd never been in. 
People even started running swastikas on their cars because they know I have Jewish blood. Other drivers, well known in my favorite sim of iRacing, have faked my account on Facebook using my profile picture and trying to replicate my style of writing. This is all nonsense. Uh, I've been a part of the NASCAR 03 community basically since its inception. I'm, I'm slightly younger than Jason, but I've been around all the main sites just because of just as a bit of a silent observer. No one was making Nazi cars. Uh, and in racing uh, was one of the biggest uh, add-on sites for NASCAR 03 back in the day, and people could just upload whatever, whatever the fuck they wanted. No one uploaded Nazi cars. No one was uploading or running uh, cars with like Nazi shit on them. Uh, in online servers, because to actually see someone's car online uh, in NRO3, you would have to physically download it. Uh, and that's a little known fact about that game. Uh, like, f- for example, if someone's running Dale Jr.'s Budweiser Born on Date car, when you, you when you would join like the Sierra online servers, it would not actually automatically download their car. You would have to have that in your game and have the matching f- the the file name matching for it to actually show up on the server as Dale Jr.'s Born on Date car. If you didn't have it, what would actually end up happening is the car would show up as like a brown or a green or like a baby blue plain Chevy Monte Carlo with a triple digit number on it. So right here, he's actually bullshitting. He's trying to say that people were running Nazi cars against him to to poke fun of him. Failing to mention that... uh, to actually see these cars, you would have to download them yourself. I can assure you, no one was making Nazi cars back in the day. It was it was just tasteless. And this was even if this was 0405, this would have been a few years a few years even before the introduction of like Forza, where it was just like the edgy thing to do is upload you know Nazi cars on a storefront. Nobody was doing this. On top of that, the fact that this dude believes people have been after him since 2004 and have been like making fake accounts or just like harassing him or whatever. This is complete bullshit. Everyone who raced against this guy, and we'll dive into this in future blog posts, have a completely different story of uh, what he was like to race with. So th- this straight up just wasn't happening. But the idea that he's been running around uh, believing people are out to get him is something that didn't start with me. It's just something he has permanently believed all the time and he just assigns to random people, which is which is quite scary to be racing with a guy and giving out your real name on, on places like iRacing or NASCAR or three leagues, uh, with this guy who's just believing that like people are out to get him, you know, like the kind of meth addict in the mall, the cameras are spying on me, dude. This is what this dude was going into leagues believing like as far back as Oh four. Then he takes a shot at Alex Wood. Who's just literally a random guy on iRacing, a random guy in the NASCAR like gaming community. He says, this poor young man has still been so off track. My heart hurts for him, even though he has called into NASCAR America and put words in my mouth that I never spoke. He has made up ridiculous lie after lie about me, and I really do feel for him. He's still featured on my friends page. I spent hours trying to help him with his issues in his life, but to no available, I, I gave him the best advice that I could help him through his situations. Unfortunately, he's one of many since my 2004 journey in sim racing who have sought to ruin my image by false accusations and slander. So again, this guy is obsessed with saying that everyone's out to get him. Uh, everyone has something out for him. Everyone's trying to ruin his name. Everyone's trying to slander him. People are after him because he's Jewish. There's been no proof for any of this. Just as someone who's you know watched NASCAR 03 and iRacing develop since the inception... I don't think I've ever seen a Nazi car. That's more of a Forza thing. Uh, it's all just nonsense. Now, Jason mentions his friends page. This is an interesting ride. Uh, Jason has this, like, friends page where he gives has, like, people who have hung out with him on Discord and puts their picture in, uh, including a peak, uh, not a peak antifreeze series driver, a Coke series driver. And it's literally them just, like, writing about how much of a good person he is, like, friend testimonials. It's bizarre, and all of these kids are, like, really, really young, which is kind of uncomfortable, but just the fact that you have an esports website and a whole page dedicated to, like, your friends saying how amazing you are is, is odd, like, you don't, you don't need to be doing this. this, this is strange. So that's the first blog post. We're going to move on to something that's called, uh, what's this thing called? Sometimes super aware, but not always. So this actually talks about uh, his his actual real world racing history, which is 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 really odd, uh, because it's it's a wild ride that I might have to uh, do a bit of translating and, and reading between the lines for you guys. 
So Jason says, often sometimes when sim racing, I have some form of super awareness sent into my mind. I have a feeling of when those virtual racing cameras were on me during broadcasts. You may have the awareness, but can you perform with it? For me, there were times I could and times that I couldn't. Sometimes I'd be making a bunch of passes and the camera hadn't caught me yet, but I could just feel when it switched on to me. That extra pressure hindered me at times. When the cameras went on to me, my forward progress stopped. Oh, okay, that's that's just called joking, bud. We had a street stock dirt car that my grandpa and I brought to the track four or five times. Each time, something broke down on the car and we sold it shortly after. During a testing session at Livonia, my buddy Cy hopped into the car and figured that we had been practicing in the wrong gear. We were wondering why the car had a great engine but just lugged around the racetrack. When Sai showed us which gear to put in it, it had two shift levers that were basically clothes hanger wires with duct tape, I took it up onto the track and immediately felt and heard the power difference. The car lasted just over three laps before the drive shaft flew out and took our gears with it. During those three laps, I would pitch the car in and mash the gas perfectly without hesitation. I had an out-of-body experience where I saw the car from my grandpa's eyes. After the wrecker pushed my idling car up onto the trailer, my grandpa said the words I had expected. Your driving brought a tear to my eyes. People in the pits were coming up and saying that it looked like I'd been driving for 30 years and I looked like a veteran. Yet that was the first and only time I ever got to drive the car at speed. As mentioned, it was plagued with mechanical issues for the few short weeks we ran it. And I have no idea who my grandpa sold it to. This is pretty incredible because it, for the longest time we actually didn't think Jason had any sort of like racing experience. But apparently he did and I've, I've seen at least one picture of him. I believe it was like a red car that he was just wheeling. It would have been either a street stock or a hobby stock car. It was really nothing special. Uh, it didn't look all that well prepared. It didn't have like contingencies on it or anything. It really was just like a 70s dirt car. Uh, he mentions taking it out to the track four or five times and constantly having mechanical issues. So he's one of the guys, and, and these happen at every track. There are guys who come out and literally do just run two laps in like the first heat. And they blow up and you never see him again. So he was actually one of those guys. And, like, nothing against him, but, like, very rarely do those guys put down a killer lap and then blow up and never come back again. Usually guys who can actually drive also have the, the car to back it up and stick around for a while. It really sounds like they got, got pardon my language, but they, but they got kind of Jude on Craigslist or, like, a Facebook classified ad and were sold just, like, a complete piece of shit car uh, and took it around the track at half speed, either during warm-up laps or, like, an open practice session, and just blew it up every time. So that there's no way you could gauge how quick a guy was on th three laps in a car that constantly wanted to blow up. It, this is just completely ridiculous. Uh, the fact that he was running in the wrong gear means this dude actually had no idea what he was doing. In most, like, oval cars that you get, either in, like, street stocks or mini stocks or, like, the kind of entry-level stuff where it's very obviously just cars off the street or, like, lightly modded stuff, again, your hobby stock, streets, minis, that sort of thing, you pretty much always run in second gear. So to me, it's odd that he, they didn't even know what gear to put it in. So it sounds like they have no idea what the fuck they're doing. He is one of those guys who just buys a car, sight unseen, shows up at the track, tries to do a few laps, blows it up, goes home, comes back the next week, blows it up, goes home, comes back the next week, blows it up, that sort of thing. There are guys out there like that, and I, I just, I feel bad for them, because it's it's rough. But it that doesn't sound like he was tearing it up on the track, and brought a tear to his grandpa's eyes, like, man, you did three laps. Like, that's not even, you're not even really got the tires warm yet, so it's kind of ridiculous that he would draw it out, into this look how amazing I was post. It's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, he then goes on to say, from perfectly timed computer failures, internet outages, fluke wrecks, hardware failures, there have been a lot of ways I've lost sim races. The loss at the top of my list came during the weightiest race in my then early sim racing career. Ray Alfala, Chris Scott, and myself were gearing up for the DMP 400. For those who don't know what DMP is, it's the Dirty Mo Posse. It was Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s like invite-only league uh, back when NASCAR 3 was pretty big. Uh, and it was basically a mix of like actual NASCAR drivers. They had like Keselowski in there, Denny Hamlin when he, when he was young, uh, Agent AJ Allmendinger is another. And it would be like a mix of those guys with just like people in the Sierra servers and the sim community who were really fucking good. I never really practiced much for events and races, but this race was different because Dale was hosting this for us. And now was my time to get into the league uh, because I had been winning races in their open servers against some of their fastest drivers. 
Ray wrecked out during the race, but coming down to the end, I was solidly in fourth place. I was the highest running non-league member when darkness set over my mind. I had told my parents earlier that morning, as well as that week, that this was the biggest sim race in my life. I adamantly but kindly told them to please not interrupt me during that race, even though they've come in during many other lesser races. I got a feeling just as the race was coming to a close that a caution was going to come out. Shortly after thinking that, yellow flag flew. Uh, without fail and perfectly timed, another stumbling block was set on my path. As we were about to go green for the final restart, my dad barged in with a loud Jason. I reluctantly turned around as I'd mashed my foot on the gas and some holding a plate of food. I had been so specific about not interrupting me for anything during this race. I expected to see myself sideways on the track when I looked back at the screen and had to gas brake, so two-foot magic save hacks, base Jacoby, and lock up to save the car from spinning. I flat-spotted the virtual tires in doing so. Uh, no, you didn't. NRO3 doesn't have flat-spotting, you idiot. And fell back to 11th or 12th by the backstretch. We had just a few laps to go, and I was able to gain only one spot back. I ended up finishing in third uh, place of the league's non-members. Basically, he choked on a restart. His dad knocked on the door and said, yo, your fucking potatoes are ready, and... That was enough to throw him off his game. So, good job, Jason. My psychic or intuitive feeling of them taking the top two non-lead members turned out to be correct, and I was on the outside looking in. I didn't tell anyone what happened in that race until a few years later. So, this, like, actually, like, really, like, pissed him off. I mean, like, I've done, like, hundreds of sim races, and, like, I, I don't remember a whole lot of them. I really don't. And this this was, like, pivotal in his in his life that, like... This was his shot to be a somebody and, and make it in NASCAR, and he choked on the restart because he got distracted by his dad barging in with potatoes. It's, it's kind of based when you really sit and think about it. I was stuck in the mindset of no matter what happened, it was an excuse if you, if you told people what slowed you down. Many racers and people aren't like that, though. The sim racers who transferred into the league were Jim Moore and Tommy Ryan, and no offense to them, but you knew their speed wouldn't set the world on fire. Not to my surprise, Mr. Jim didn't last very long in the league. It's actually pretty impressive that he remembers this stuff from, like, 16 or 17 years ago. I mean, like, I ran an NRO3 league at the time, and I was I was maybe 12 or 13, just trying to, trying to do the math in my head here. And, like, I remember, like, two guys I raced with. I couldn't tell you who won or where I finished. It's, it's pretty wild he remembers this. My year or two of persuading Ray Alfalo to try and make Dirty Mo Posse eventually paid off as he got into the league during one of my hiatuses from sim racing. I switched between dial-up and ISDN. We moved from Colorado to Georgia. These things took me away from sim racing for a few months, but when we had a high-speed internet set up in Georgia, I was able to get into DMP with a recommendation from Ray. So, this is actually true. He did used to race with Ray Alfalo way back in the day. Like, way back in the day. But, obviously, Ray realized this guy was kind of a schizo. And, uh kind of distance himself from them, but, like, this part is actually true. He did used to race with Ray Alfal and Dale Earnhardt Jr., it just wasn't very often. So, basically, this guy was pretty obsessed with NASCAR 03. Like, dude, I love sim racing, I, I think it's great. I love getting excited for league races, I like practicing a whole bunch for them and, and wasting a ton of my time building setups. This is a guy who believed, like, this was this was his ticket somewhere. So in the next blog post, we actually find out what happened to his street stock career. It's called Explaining What I Never Could. He posted this on February 23rd of 2021, so just earlier this year. And this kind of explains what happened to his street stock uh, exploits. Because there's what he said in the previous blog post where it just blew up a whole bunch and they had to sell the car. But this actually kind of goes into what really did happen. So he says, I often think of the butterfly effect and how every detail of life had to happen before I was conceived. Uh, that, that's a little deep there. I think of how each human being is given a life that experiences the good and the bad. Looking back at the wars and atrocities throughout human history, it becomes clear that all of those things were necessary for us to be born. I've often experienced a profound lack of control steering me in a direction other than peace, and that's that's more or less you're describing schizophrenia, my man. One of those many moments came while I was at my grandparents' house in late 2007, watching my cousin and brother work on the trailer for my race car. As I was admiring them for the work they were doing, I was full of love and gratitude on the inside, yet outwardly I kept being extremely mean to them. My voice was harsh, and I was saying things that were rude. They quit on me very quickly, and I lost two of my three pit crew members. They never returned, and only my grandpa remained to help me in, to and from the racetrack each week. So this is actually why they got rid of the street stock, just based on what I've read here. Uh, it sounded like he was just like having meltdowns at home, and just like being a cunt to his family, and just like lipping them off, and saying kind of the same schizo shit that we would see on YouTube. 
And like his uncle and his brother were just like, or his cousin or his brother were just like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Like he's a schizo. Like this, this is, there's no point to us doing this. And they just fucked off and it was left for their grandpa to just kind of like watch over Jason. And then with the car being so shitty, they're just like, yeah, this is a waste of time. Like he's a schizo. We go and try to hang out with him and he just like screams at us and says crazy shit all the time. And the car we bought him doesn't really work anyway, and it just blows up on us, so, like, fuck this. Just let him play his computer games for now. It sounds like that's what happened. Many never understand what it's like to be trapped inside your mind. Actually, hold on. I'd already been wounded very badly in the school system, and my life was falling apart every turn. Upstairs, mentally, there was no peace. Without any control, I was derailing myself from any chance at a racing career. Yeah. What he's experiencing is is essentially early-onset schizophrenia, which in some way is 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 sad and like I kind of have sympathy for the guy but like it really doesn't seem like he has any sort of like structured guidance here it just sounds like they're trying to force him to do like normal people activities or they're like trying their best to get like some sort of a normal life together and it's just not working many may never understand what it's like to be trapped inside your mind watching all your hard work be thrown away by improper speech and actions okay like he again he's just describing schizophrenia I was blessed by God to get into Dale Jr.'s league, and through a series of traumatic events, what I've just described began to take place. It never righted until recently when I was able to blog about my experiences on this website. I'm still not in the complete control that made me extremely sharp on the sim race track, but I have a knowing that everything serves God's plan. This is where he starts really going into his Jesus talk. But this is interesting. Even though suicidal since the age of 14... At 17 is when the transformation I've been mentioning really took place. My inner sanity took off. In the beginning of these days, May of 07, I turned directly to the Bible to figure out what had happened to my mind. So this is really important. I want you to just remember this when we start getting into the, uh, the, next, the next blog post I've got on the docket here. My man's been suicidal since, if I do the math, I believe it's 2004. So I am, I'm 12. Because I think he's only a few years older than me. So I'm 12. Just just remember that. He he's been he's been wanting to kill himself since 14. So he goes uh on to the on to more about Bible shit here. No matter my prayers, my gifts did not return. My mind was filled from recent traumas and the torment of watching the opportunities that I've worked for leave me with no chance of holding on to them. I even sounded so horrible in my post-race interviews in Juniors League and my skills in interviews have been a strength that had gotten me promoted. Like, he, the amount of weight he puts on just, like, playing NRO3 and being good at NRO3 is just, is just wild. And again, more about God's plan. So, before we move on to the next uh, page here, just remember, he writes specifically here, even though suicidal at the age of 14, at 17 is when the transformation I've been mentioning really took place. So, this, this dude has wanted to kill himself for, like, basically half of his life. Uh, he takes any sort of perceived insult or slight in the sim racing world. He just blows it out of proportion. He gets really emotional about it. Uh, in our very first blog post that we read, uh, he says that people have been out to get him and riding not and driving Nazi cars and harassing him and being out to get him. So we get to this post on 10 17 2020. There is no doubt that Austin Ogonoski has stalked me. He's been a dog since the moment I spotted him on iRacing. I always tried to be good to him, but never could side with the light. Honestly, I never talked to him. I saw him in, like, the the random a fixed race, but that was it. I never had him on, like, TeamSpeak or anything like that. I, don't, I think I had him on Facebook, but, like, I never said a word to him. It was just, like, you would add people on iRacing if you wanted to, like, all, like, jump in the same a fixed race and just, like, stack the field for iRating. I even attempted to lay down my life since his spirit was one of darkness and death upon me. Okay, so that's bullshit because in your last blog post we read, you've actually been suicidal since I was 12. We we wouldn't meet for like a whole decade. So this whole contacting my employer and saying a bunch of shit saying, I drove you to suicide, I'm sorry I didn't. It's on your own blog. My lap times would be much slower every time I would think about him. That That's actually pretty based. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that's pretty funny. Everyone said to pay him no attention, but God showed me that he was going to be my greatest enemy online, so I'm part of God's plan? Okay. This is an interesting line. His constant attacks brought actual NASCAR media members to my original YouTube channel, many of whom made fun of me. So apparently people in the NASCAR world actually know of this guy. If this blog is to be believed, 
uh, people in the NASCAR world, whether it be crew members or like media members, press members, whoever, they all actually know of him. And it's entirely possible that they've like sat around and like sent each other like Jacoby vids being like, what the fuck's going on with this dude? Like this dude's a creep. Again, God works in mysterious ways. That and Keys to the Kingdom were two quotes I was told to look for in Dale Jr.'s download with Mr. McReynolds. So, on top of being obsessed with me, he's he's believing that the Dale Jr. download podcast has, like, secret phrases that only he can understand. He actually elaborates on this in, in a couple blog posts I've got listed. He really does think that, like, the Dale Jr. download is a way for Dale to, like, secretly communicate with him. It's it's wild. I again, I can't believe pe- more people haven't like read this shit. Then he says, "I believe Agnoski was created to bring more unjust hatred to me and let God's light shine." O- o- okay, light or dark, hate or great, what's it gonna be? I'm going to quote my YouTube video that saw the most views. I just like to thank God for everything and life in general. The life is some bi- uh, has been something I've wanted to be over with many many times. I keep in mind that his is as limited as mine. My enemies were created for a reason, and I'm not sure why. So again, a really interesting post because he said he's suicidal since twenty since 2004, but then he blames me for driving him to suicide. So, so what? He's not getting his story straight. It's really so. Basically, why I'm showing you this is any sort of like defamation thing. If I'm going to take this guy to, to like, a, like any sort of civil litigation, I can use this blog post in, in tandem with the last one and be like, look, this dude, you know, made a bunch of shit saying I drove him to suicide. But on all these other blog posts, he's said that, actually, no, I've been suicide bas- suicidal basically my whole life. And, like, it, I just assign blame to random people I encounter. And he's been doing that, again, since 04 where he would accuse people of running Nazi cars against him when the game wouldn't actually show him any Nazi cars unless he downloaded them. It's 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 a trip. So, the fifth blog post and the last of this segment, lasting effects from the mental hospital. So, for those who don't know, in, I believe, August of last year, he was admitted to a psych facility against his will because his YouTube videos were just completely off the deep end. And, uh... He's blogged about his experience in the mental hospital a few times. But this is probably the most detailed one. So, he starts with a preface saying, My mom and I have undergone long talks to build a bridge towards getting me on the track that's best for me. The following is a story about what took place in August before construction of a better road began. After a series of YouTube videos demonstrating what had been done to me through acts of bullying, so anyone who has called this guy on his shit or been like, yo, you need to stop being a creep and like stalking your middle school teacher. He calls them bullies. So, after a series of YouTube videos demonstrating what had been done to me through acts of bullying, I was admitted against my will into a rehabilitation center here in Gainesville, Georgia. I believe it's called Laurelwood. There was a, another, in, uh, not inmate, uh, in, inpatient uh, that was in there with him who commented on his videos and, and leaked a bunch of shit. So in the center, they mandate you to take medicine. If you refuse por- pill form, they force injections on you. You are fed junk food instead of health food, and no music is played. Hardly any outdoor time is allowed, and physical activity is limited to pushing the chairs around the lunchroom when the nurses don't forbid it. I was doing push-ups, sit-ups, and leg raises in my room, too. I went to the hospital weighing 140, came out at 160. Two months removed and on a court-mandated injection every month, and two pills every night administered by my strict father, I'm now weighing in at over 180 pounds, which, Jason's a pretty tall dude, so this is actually isn't the worst thing. He's, he's actually a bit on the skinny side at 140 and I think 6'1 or 6'2. I've been pushing my body to the point of failure, and the fat keeps getting added. These are the results of being a slave to the system when I'm mandated to take medicine against my will. Most of the nurses in charge at the hospital had a problem with refilling my water, saying I was drinking too much water and should get a soda instead. There's no way they said that to them. These were the same nurses who sat around and played on their phones. The system of how we treat people in attitude, physically and medicinally, has gone bonkers. Thanks for 45 pounds of fat, doctors. I told them before they gave it to me that it was probably just going to add weight to me. I don't feel any better by being on a medication I never wanted. In fact, I'm just more of a disgruntled human being living in the broken system of America. So... Reading between the lines here, court mandated uh, injections and forced against your will into a psychiatric assessment facility. This is some pretty serious shit. Again, reading between the lines, 
to for things to get to this point, it has to be pretty bad. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that had to have happened for this to be warranted. They don't just they don't just take people against their will every day off the street and toss them into a psych ward. It has to be a complete fuck fest. So whatever was happening in let's say August or September of last year for for this dude to get admitted and be on court mandated injections, uh, th- he's in some serious shit. And and to even admit that, as if it's a bad thing, on his blog. Again, they, they, these aren't just handed out like candy. This is some serious shit. Uh, if Chris was on here, I know he'll be on here later tonight to play Halo. He he knows the exact uh, medication Jason was Jason was probably on, but it is to treat schizophrenia. And uh, I believe it's called Haldol. Does that sound right? I'd, I'd have to Google it really quick, but it's something with an H that is for schizophrenia. And f- in some ways, Jason's right. It was just not working. But it sounds like he was in a serious enough state to warrant it, which, like, the threshold for, for this is is insanely high. Insanely high. So, so what again, whatever was happening, there's what we knew in the sim racing community based on his videos, and there's, you know, like, the, the 75% we didn't see, you know, when he'd sign off YouTube. Whatever is happening here is, is, just, is just off the rails. So that shows you how serious the situation was, even just beyond like his crazy videos against like Ray Alfalo for getting him into porn. Uh, for again, just just to hit that threshold, like it's it's impressive. That that's some serious serious shit. So for part two of these blog posts, we're actually going to go on to what's called the Dale Saga. So because Jason, as we've gone through already, used to race with uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. This kind of set him on a path mixed with his like schizo delusions, believing Dale Jr. would hire him. So he's been for years obsessed with uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and trying to get him to notice him through video games. And the reason for this isn't entirely delusional. Uh, Dale was himself a pretty big video game addict back in the day. He's talked about this on the Dale Jr. download. And uh, basically, a lot of people that are behind the scenes at Junior Motorsports or just close personal friends with Dale uh, actually got to know him through NASCAR 03 in that private online league. Uh, It was just what Dale did. They were all big sim racers in the early to mid 2000s. And Jason saw guys like Brad Keselowski come along and go from just racing in Dale's league to being championship winning uh, cup, cup drivers. Uh, he, he's raced with Denny Hamlin, he's raced with, uh, Josh Berry, Martin Truex Jr., AJ Allmendinger, uh, really the young crop of, of cup drivers, or what you'd consider the young crop of cup drivers from, like, the mid-2000s. Jason actually all knew, and in his mind, he believed that if he impressed them enough, he would get a ride. And I know that sounds completely insane, but... He spells it out here in his blog posts, and he has several blog posts dedicated to just, like, ranting about Dale Jr. So, on, I guess, March 17th of this year, he writes, As a youngster, there's a lot to be gathered from watching the NASCAR races on TV. You could learn certain lines on the racetrack, obtain a grasp of what the overall audience wanted, and glean what you needed if it was the career path you were given desire to chase. Okay. One of the most important things was learning from the mistakes others were making. You learned from the guys who were given less car control, lesser skill in interviews, and all the other little details. You learned what was appropriate based on the reactions of the audience. So, like, as this dude's watching NASCAR, he's just, like, not watching NASCAR just to hang out. He's watching NASCAR and, like, studying it. So, like, even as a teenager, he's like, I'm going to be a NASCAR driver. And, like, every little interview that's given and, like, every little practice session, he's just watching it. Being like, one day Dale Jr. is going to recruit me and I'm going to be in NASCAR. And I have to take notes of all of this. When my journey in sim racing began, enough mistakes have been made by others, so I learned how to control my car appropriately. Given an eye to see where others are lacking, I pursued developing myself in places that others weren't. Video editing, car painting, putting the fans first place in interviews. Without their lack and my eye for detail, I would not have been influenced to go beyond and develop talents where others weren't using them. So, even in the sim racing community, like... 
he's like learning how to paint cars and shit, not just for the fun of it, but because like he's dead set that he's gonna make it to NASCAR by being good at NASCAR 03. Which is just it's mind blowing. Slurp slurp. But just as you have to have examples to inspire yourself, you have to have opposition that'll tear you down. This never happened more powerfully than when I was 17. My will to live, my ability to be inspired was crushed. Yes, God owns a spiritual realm, but what happens in a physical influences you internally. After taking such a hard hit at 17, I could no longer make videos, paint cars, speak how I wanted to in interviews. When it came to the driving, I started making all the mistakes I had learned not to by watching others. I started driving into wrecks I saw coming or moving up and down the wrong groove on the racetrack. And losing the intangibles, it gave me the opportunity to, to climb the ladder uh, in Dale Jr.'s league. So, from just reading between the lines, it sounds like the first major like onset of schizophrenia was in high school. And, like, not only did it just, like, it, it fuck his tree up just in everyday life, but, like, it just made him shit at everything. Which, like, it happens. It's like a Terry A. Davis type thing. While I was going through this mighty internal struggle, the guys in this league that I looked up to so much were hammering me so hard. They could not understand I was trapped in a mental jail cell, stemming from very l rough situations in my personal life. As expected, I was eventually removed from Dale Jr.'s league, and the career I'd had a passion for was gone. So there's really two things here. Dale Jr. and, like, his buddies don't want to babysit some, like, teenage kid who's, like, going through a schizo meltdown. Like, that's not Dale Jr.'s job when he's running a NASCAR 03 league. And, like, I've said this time and time again, especially dealing with, like, other leagues. Like, if someone's being, like, very disruptive and, like, just very obviously doesn't have the social skills to be in, like, an online league and just get along with people, you're not their babysitter. Like, you're there to race. Just, like, if you go to a fucking men's league, like, soccer, or, like, playing, like, softball with somebody, you're not obligated to sit there and basically be, like, a special needs, like, tarred wrangler. You're not. You're there to have fun. And it, it seems like Junior and, like, Almondinger and all those guys were like, oh, this guy's kind of a schizo, and we don't have to deal with this if we don't want to, because there's literally hundreds of people who want in our private league, so we're just going to dump them. To me, it sounds like that's what happened what's also odd though is that he calls this a career it really wasn't a career it was a private league with like maybe a couple hundred dollars in payouts because that was just common back then i mean i'd have to talk to someone who's who was more into dmp than i obviously was because i just kind of watched from afar but like this wasn't even esports it was just like it really was just like a private league for like all the nascar guys to fuck around with and just you know indulge in their their passion for like the sport itself so the idea that he saw this as, like, a career when everyone else was just, like, fucking around and being like, well, I guess we'll all get the boys together on Tuesday night and, and you know, run the Truck Series mod and half-distance races because, like, it's fun. Jason was under the belief that, like, this was a serious deal and every single race mattered and counted and people were scouting him, which was just not happening. This And this is it right here. This is kind of the defining moment of this whole blog. The reason I started sim racing was to get a ride from Junior, and I only made it to his number three car online. I followed the blueprint God gave me until enough was against me, and I couldn't. So, this is a guy who, upon learning that like all the NASCAR guys were playing video games online together just for the hell of it, this was a guy who like stretched that interpretation to be to basically be like the virtual equivalent of like the opening cutscene in like NASCAR 05 Chase for the Cup. So it's like, and, and based on when that game came out, maybe he actually had that idea. Maybe he saw it as, hey, there's that opening intro to NASCAR 05 where you beat Ryan Newman in a Dodge Viper, and he gives you a ride in his mod team. That, that's really how that game's career mode starts. Go look it up. I wonder if he saw that and was like, well, maybe if I beat Dale at like a video game online, he'll recruit me into NASCAR. I seriously wonder if, if, like, that's how this all started, is just the fucking EA game. But there it is in black and white right there. The reason I started sim racing was to get a ride from Junior. So this guy has this, like, massive schizo delusion and actually gets a bit further along than he thought he would. And he actually starts racing against Junior and beating him a few times. 
but was still under this like grandiose impression that like you win a couple video game races and you're straight to the cup series when it was just it was ridiculous. Through the recent years, I've taken heavy blows from the online world that accuses me of any mental illnesses and crime you can think of. If something inspired me to chase NASCAR, what inspired them to make such hateful videos, comments, and articles, and lies about me? Perhaps they have their own mental illness where they can't stop talking about Jason Jacoby. I actually really like that. I think that's really cute. But, uh... Just, just reading this, like... I mean, this guy really is being charged with, like, battery. This guy really is being charged with, like, aggravated stalking. This guy really did make videos, like, threatening to kill his middle school teacher. And he's just convinced that, like, none of this even happened. Which is really terrifying. You know, like... Like, for example, like, I've, I've gone out with girls that, like, I didn't really like. Or, like, it didn't really work out and, like, I didn't really see him again. And, like, I have no problem admitting it. This guy is, like, really, he really is uploading videos of him threatening to kill his middle school teacher and, like, wishing death upon his ex-girlfriend. And when confronted about it, his immediate reaction is just be like, it's all lies. Even when, like, he's he's caught in the act. Even when people are like, we literally have you on video saying all this shit. Oh, no, no, I didn't. It's all lies. It's all slander. That's not good. That kind of, that kind of thinking is really scary. Because that basically means there's no limit to what this guy will do, and he will just not remember it. So then he quotes Isaiah 43, 4. Others were given in exchange for you. I trade their lives for yours because you're precious to me. You are honored, and I love you. This, this has nothing to do with anything. In this verse, God is saying that he lays down the lives of others for his chosen. I can only think of all the NASCAR drivers who made the mistakes that I learned from and all the people who died before you and I were born. People lived hard lives before you and I ever made it onto the scene and good and bad times shape who we become, our children become. In the end, I give all credit to the maker. This this has nothing to do with fucking anything. On to post number seven, about halfway done here. We're getting close to the halfway marker. I do like how he titles his blog posts almost like they're songs. He has really creative titles, and I actually really enjoy that part of his blog. So this is on 8-11-2021. This is not that long ago. It was maybe a week ago. A uh, week, two weeks. Surely Dale Jr. remembers me. We began to communicate with each other through YouTube videos, even though our only in-person interaction came at Sherry and Martin's charity event in 2019. So Jason thinks that like anytime Dale Jr. uploads, Dale Jr. is, like, sending hidden messages to him that only he can understand. That's not good. Dale didn't hire me on the basis of having no talent. He put it puts in position those whom he feels will benefit the sport and do good for as many people as possible. He has an eye for talent, and I didn't go unnoticed. Events from the previous post depict offline spiritual events, which de- derailed me from the path I most wanted. But I learned to use every experience I've been taken through to help educate others. As my eye became more keen to turning to tuning it into a law stream, I witnessed Dale dropping some quotes as he was gearing up to go green at Homestead. Lay down the law, which is when I was familiar with him saying in sim racing. We communicated back and forth through special phrases in his Dale Jr. download, namely the Ask Jr. portion of the show, and all the quotes serve their purpose. So Jason's watching the Dale Jr. download, which I, I believe it's on TV uh, like, they actually have the cameras on the faces of, like, each podcast guest. And he believes that, like, random shit Dale says is actually Dale subtly communicating to Jason Jacoby. This is unbelievable shit right here. Like, this is... This is this is some next-level shit. And, and again, I go back to what I mentioned at, at the beginning of this of this video. There are people who genuinely read this blog and thought there was nothing wrong with it, and oh, Jason just really likes scripture and shit because he's from the South. No, he's actually admitting on here that when he watches like random TV segments with like like NASCAR personalities, that that they they say special messages to him and they communicate with him. This is a fuck. This is this is a wild ride. And he says thanks to the messengers who helped relay messages at the onset. So he also believes that like I guess his staff. Or, like, the Dale Jr. download staff, like, you know, all the people who, like, determine the, the scripts for the show and shit like that, and just, like, the subjects, that they're in on it, too. 
I take no credit because God was the one in control the whole time, pouring out remembrance of his lost driver. Surely God also know the tremendous weight I've been under for many years of my life and knows the inner desire I've had that longs to do good for other people. The day is coming, and I'm living every moment in occurrence until and after it is accomplished. If this interpretation is correct, I will one day have a seat in a NASCAR race car. This is some wild shit, man. I'm more... What's this, uh... <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? I'm more impressed that my man's watching the Dale Jr. download and thinks Dale is talking to him. And to answer, uh... Terry Hell, I think I pronounced that right. The only reason I've really, like, dug into this deep is because when you do deal with, like, a, a cyber stalk stalking situation like this, the police actually do want you to, like, go through and document everything. And especially if, like, you've lost your job over this guy... They really want you to be, like, pretty meticulous and, like, just save fucking everything and really understand what kind of person you're dealing with. So, like, when you actually do go to the police, which, thankfully, I can reveal that a file has been started and I do have a case number and all that shit. Uh, they just they just want you to go through it so you can do all the grunt work for them, which is kind of a piss-off. But I figured it would be interesting now that I've gone through most of his blog to, uh... To kind of isolate like the wildest shit that I've found. Because it, again it really did go from. Oh this guy's just obsessed with, with scripture. To like hey this is like a, a pretty serious problem here. So he does end the blog post saying like. It's his, basically his destiny to, to, to race a NASCAR. And like this is just not happening. So next we go into one of Dale's drivers. Which is another recent post from 817. And this is similar to the, the harassment campaign he conducted against me where he instructed people to write Slightly Mad and Codemasters and EA. He actually does the same thing with Dale Jr. here. So he's kind of got like the same base playbook he uses where he just wants people to mass email on his behalf. So this is something he regularly does, I guess. He writes, hey friends, site statistics reveal that visits to this site are going up. Thank you for reading and sharing when you feel the ability to do so. May I employ you to do me another favor? Please email Junior Motorsports at shop tours at JMR Racing or JRM Racing and refer them to this website. Personally, I'm available for contact at any races email. This serves not only me, but you as well. Give back more to the fans who aren't as blessed financially. Give all credit to God for creating a place for us to race. Preach kindly the importance of taking care of yourself with proper nutrients. Make a way for someone like myself to prove that you can face any adversity on the track and still not use foul language for families to hear. Give 100% of my winnings to charity and reconnect me with a long-lost friend, Dale Jr. As of now, I'm using a flip phone for all my cell phone needs. Though I used to respond up to 50 messages daily, I found that's much more helpful to preach to many people at once. One-on-one -on -one communication is appropriate at times, with messages contained within these blogs are meant for the masses. The last year has been training for me to stick with what got me the customer service accolades, and that is the aforementioned leading with kindness. So he's instructing people here to, to harass Dale Jr. and beg him to hire Jason Jacoby for, the, for either the Cup Series or what would be the Xfinity Series, I guess. So, first of all, this is not good. Uh, you shouldn't be instructing people to like embark on a harassment campaign like this. Like, Dale, Dale Jr. very obviously doesn't want to hear from him, and especially someone in our comments mentioned that Jr. had, like, blocked him on Twitter, so it's likely Jr. is like, what the fuck is this guy doing? The other thing is that, like, I don't know if there's any sort of court order in place, but, like, let's say, let's say JRM actually did get some sort of restraining order against Jacoby. This is not good. Instructing other people to, to contact or mass contact JRM on behalf of Jason if there's already a restraining order in place. Like, you could get a lot in a lot of shit. If, like, you're one of Jason's, like, few, for example, like, guys left from his Discord and you start, like, hitting up JRM, you could get yourself in a lot of shit for, like, following through on this. But it, it kind of shows that, like, Jason has this, I guess, modus operandi of. I guess getting what what they would call flying monkeys to like do his dirty work for him. Like first he wants, you know, he wants everyone to donate to charity water and charity water, and then he wants everyone to to write SMS and get me fired, 
and now he wants everyone to go contact Dale Earnhardt Jr. and and write messages to his race team shop begging them to hire Jason Jacoby. It it seems like this is what he does. And again, that that's really not good. That could get him in a serious amount of trouble already. So this obviously doesn't let up. We go on to our next post. And it's just called Hey Dale. And this one's really recent. It's the 23rd today. This is actually posted on the 19th. He says, Howdy Dale. I'm sitting here just twiddling my thumbs. I'm just waiting for you to give NASCAR's best driver a shot. I'm writing blogs that preach about what NASCAR's lacking. And I'm just waiting for you to put me on TV. I'm just waiting for you to give some talent a shot and make a good investment. Even better than buying Mike Davis a boat. I'm waiting for you to place a winning bet on another sim racer. You put Martin in home, took care of Brad, and you're doing the same for Josh. I'm just waiting. So he almost feels like entitled that like all these guys that Junior sim raced with ended up making it in NASCAR to some extent. Martin is Martin Truex Jr., Brad is Brad Keselowski, and Josh is obviously Josh Berry. And Jacoby believes that he too, I guess, deserves this. Which is why he continues to harass and, and beg Junior basically for a job, which is just, just odd. We then move into blog post called Why in This World. This is an interesting one too because he actually changes up his approach. He says, why in this world are we even here? Is it to cause problems and whine about how things went wrong in an NASCAR race? Is it to advertise junk food as well as junk attitudes? And then instead of asking Junior for a ride... He actually goes after Joe Gibbs Racing instead. This is really interesting. He says, It's widely accepted that Denny Hamlin isn't that smart. He's very instinctive on the racetrack sometimes, but not very likable in most of his out-of-car appearances. He whines about all these first-world problems, acting like losing a race is the biggest deal in the world. If Coach is a righteous man, he'll pick me to deliver good messages and interviews. If Coach doesn't care, then he can keep Denny and let him continually, uh, continually deliver his stupidity. I like that. I like that. Because it's, it's a FedEx reference. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> the best NASCAR driver hasn't even gotten a shot. I'm telling you that I'm the one to bring it international attention. But maybe JGR cares more about winning races than doing what's right. Keep Kyle in the M&M's car catering unhealthy foods to children while having a mouth of foul language. If there's anything to be upset about in NASCAR, what happens on the racetrack is in last place. It's what is displayed in their attitudes when they walk by the fans and the words they so frequently speak in their interviews. And then he gets mad at M&M's because it's candy and they shouldn't advertise candy because candy's unhealthy. So he's sitting around believing that like not only Dale Jr. is writing messages to or sending messages to him in the Dale Jr. download that only he can understand. But like he's he thinks that like, well, maybe if Jr. doesn't hire me, maybe Gibbs will hire me. And this is a 31-year-old man who, like, really hasn't accomplished anything beyond being, like, a somewhat, I guess, okay successful iRacing streamer. Like, it's it's really weird. Just, just convinced that, like, uh, Joe Gibbs knows who he is and will, like, give him a shot. Like, it's it's odd, man. Now, the final part of the Dale Jr. saga, this one's called Altering Atlanta is Great, but Let's Alter the Atmosphere. NASCAR is great, but its current generation is missing a few critical pieces that are needed to optimize its performance. This is, I think, right after the Atlanta reconfig was announced. A couple of weekends ago, I met TJ Maters and Freddie Kraft at one of the AMS fan zones. It was really cool to meet them, and they were friendly. But I couldn't help thinking, where are the drivers? The spotters earn much less of a paycheck and have much less star power, but they're out there interacting with the fans. I can remember meeting Ken Trader. I was a young boy. His friendliness left an indelible mark on me, and I'll always be appreciative of that good memory in life. Even as a YouTuber who strove to be as friendly as possible to everyone whom I met, I received the treatment of a king from those who approached me when they noticed me at the track. And let's not forget the king was the king because he took care of his fans. While some drivers seem uh, discontented with certain decisions, I'd be viewing NASCAR as my employer, and as an employee, I would do my best for the company. As I worked in retail for over a decade, the focus was on the customer and serving their needs. This led to many accolades, favor from the customers, and higher sales due to customer satisfaction. I have a drive to race and would love to drive AMS in any config that the authorities wish to set it up in. 
If Dale Jr. or any team owner would like a health-conscious, musically gifted, well-spoken, kind, and charitable driver, please use the email given at the Friends page. That page shows the importance of fans. So again, just like begging Dale Jr. to hire him. It's it's wild to read. Uh, the one thing that kind of strikes out to me is that, like, how does this guy know what, like, TJ Majors and Freddie Kraft look like? This is some serial killer tier manifesto writing. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, when I've shown this to certain people, they just see it as, like, scripture. And they're just like, oh, he's one of those, like, Jesus freaks, I guess. You actually have to go back, like, a few pages and, and really, like, split hairs into his blog to see how demented it, it is sometimes. Just like, so that's five or six posts just over and over again begging Dale to hire him. Like, it's weird, man. He also demonstrates in this post his obsession with customer service. So basically this whole time this guy's been, like, on YouTube, he's always worked, like, random jobs that are just, like, retail-focused. So, like, he's worked at... Like Domino's Pizza, he's worked at like Big Law, it's just like really entry level shit. And he's just become obsessed with like, look how great my customer service is. It's the best. No one has better customer service than service uh, stories than me. I get five star reviews on Google all the time, and he like uses this as justification as to why he should be an NASCAR driver. So it's it's really odd that, like, this is really all he can say for himself is that, like, well, I worked at Big Lots and, like, I got a couple five-star reviews on Google, so that means I'm the best at talking to customers. It's, it's, it's very narcissistic, but, like, the worrying kind. Like, it's, it's a level of delusion that is, is quite scary, in my opinion. Catholic Kavanaugh, yes, uh, I mean, you'll have to watch the, the VOD of this when it goes up, but in his earlier blog post that I mentioned on the stream, uh, he did drive a street stock for, like, a few days, and it blew up on him a bunch of times because they basically just bought a piece of shit car, and then he screamed at his family members who helped work on the car because he was a schizo, and they all just said, fuck it, and, and just let his dream die. So now we move on to stage three. Which is Domino's Pizza Outbursts and Other Schizo Nonsense. That's just what I have in the notepad document here, so we'll change the background. So this next one's called Open Letter to Domino's, and this is in the middle of 2020. This is really deranged. One of my favorite ones, actually. Or, actually, this is in December of 2020. So, as a lot of people know, Jason kind of became infamous on iRacing as a streamer for being, like, this just really obsessed with Domino's. They didn't actually, like, pay him or sponsor him. He just, he worked there. And he thought he would just shill for the company he worked for because it was just something to put on his car. But eventually he quit there after three or four years. And now he's just extremely pissed off at them. So he's written a couple blog posts <clears throat> just shitting on the Domino's pizza he worked at. So, over the Christmas holidays, he wrote an open letter to Domino's Pizza. Dear Domino's, as you now sponsor a driver who runs a whorehouse out of his home, I have yet another reason to root against you. Don't mind the fact that drivers already don't represent the sport very well, not many are happy to engage in media interviews, and they typically focus only on race results rather than the fans and sponsors paying the bills, but it's what you're doing to the fans that hurts the most. You are selling junk food that contributes to them being overweight, out of shape, and less immune to things like COVID-19. Not only that, but you fail to tell customers that your drivers, with the exceptions of Denny Hamlin and Bubba Wallace, earn less than the minimum wage while on deliveries. In my case, while on deliveries, we made 4 bucks per hour and a very small mileage fee. If we weren't tipped, we burned up tires, more fuel, and motor oil for less than minimum wage. You're just like the sport you have a hand in polluting. You put your profits on over consumer health and don't give enough credit to the ones who keep you running. I hate Domino's Pizza because their, their crust always tastes like cardboard. Uh, so I'm, I'm neutral on this issue, but opening, <laughs> opening the, opening the open letter by saying you sponsor a driver who runs a whorehouse out of his home. I, I don't think that's the right approach. And this is what I mean, where even if like the last half of the, the blog posts I've read so far are just kind of like, 
moderate schizo nonsense. This is this is pretty wild. He really doesn't like Domino's anymore, uh, which is odd because obviously this is now how we knew him. We knew him as the Domino's guy on on stream, and he's he's not happy with them. I don't actually know which driver he's talking about. I think it's Hamlin. Because I know Hamlin's been on the dirty a few times. But I don't I don't know which driver he's actually talking about. But he's mad. He's he's really mad at Domino's. So the next one is called Doomed at Domino's because he, he's still mad at Domino's about half a year later. So this came out on 8-9-2021, so three weeks ago. So his preface, he writes, through my dream and prayer in my late teens was starting to e start was to start eating healthy and working out. I was wrestled down by the effects of life circumstances that took me off my desired path. Fueled by a spirit of naivety, I served customers processed food that worsened their health. Nowadays I stand for exercise and educating others about healthy eating and good nutrition. So he's I guess he's reformed? Maybe? Like is that sorry, I'm I had a bunch of root beer. But He's like reformed now and having to apologize for all those times on streams he would promote Domino's Pizza. Like, no one really cares, my man. Like, shit. So, he's he's really upset about a Domino's core worker he had. He says, I sometimes think of how I must have hopped in my car at just the right time to hear something on the radio, stopped at a customer's house, or took certain routes that now stand out to me. One such time was when I took three deliveries in a row to three streets that had the names of NASCAR tracks. Darlington Station Road, Bristol Trace, and one other that slips my mind right now. What's even more special about the trio deliveries is how those street names were the three tracks that NASCAR is headed to next in its schedule. And all in the same order that they were scheduled. So this is what a lot of schizos do. Uh, they try and like find patterns where there aren't any. So, like, he'd be driving and be like, oh, those three streets have the same names as NASCAR races. And instead of being like, that's, like, a really cool coincidence, and just kind of respecting, like, the math involved for, like, a coincidence like that to play out, he'd be like, no, this is actually a sign from God. While some parts of the job were enjoyable, I could never move the deep pain of being taken away from a dream due to damage I received at 17. He talks about this this episode at 17, but never actually mentions what it is. Throughout all my deliveries, I never felt like I really had a purpose there. Day by day, the feeling grew worse as I continued to face battles in the online and offline worlds. Like, the way he talks about just, like, yeah, a couple of people were pricked to me online. Or, like, I was just kind of, I've, I was just stuck working this, like, shitty minimum wage job. Like, everything has to be, like, dressed up as, like, as if we're, like... As if he's writing his own Netflix documentary, really. He delivered pizza to Sears Point Drive and flipped out. Damn, dude. I actually got offered the job at Domino's when their general manager came into Big Lots. After a couple of transactions, he begged me to come just down the street and work for him. He said that they could really use customer service like the kind I provided. So again, this, this, this like narcissistic delusion where, yeah, I got a job at Domino's and like... I was working at Big Lots, and this guy came in and begged me to come work for them, and he saw my five-star reviews on, on Google Earth or Google Maps, and that I was the number one customer service person at, at Big Lots, and they just needed to have me on their team. Like, bro, that's not what happened. Like, you probably just, like, applied to Domino's Pizza. Like, it's a theme on these blogs that, like, everyone who encounters him and when he tells the story, he dresses it up in such a ridiculous way. And you just kind of have to learn how to read through that. So after making the jump from cashier to pizza delivery driver, I was ready to roll. I was so excited to provide great customer service to people. There, there, there it goes again, that kind of narcissistic part. And make them happy that they order Domino's. Like, he almost goes into this mode where he's, like, stuck just, like, repeating the lines over and over again from each customer. As it went on, however, my manager could not have put me with a worse trainer. Can you relate to being around people who dampen your day? One of my best friends was just telling me of her negative surroundings at work. Yeah, that, that happens all the time, bud. When I embarked on my first ride along with my coworker, my intuition was telling me to keep quiet, but there's always been an override that painfully breaks through what my intuition tells me, and I have now come to trust God when I feel that I've betrayed that sense of knowing better. I cast my pearl before my swine and began to tell them of how excited I was to deliver and make people happy. 
Every time I spoke something positive, he came back with the most unenthusiastic and negative response. It was a typical moment of light versus dark. So, so my man's just like going on like his first delivery run. He's like, man, I'm, I'm so excited to work for Domino's pizza and deliver this awesome pizza, you know, the best in the nation. And the dude in the passenger seat's like, oh fuck, we hired a schizo. Like, you know, that's how that conversation went. After telling me how crappy our customers were, he then went on to tell me about what made him excited at work. Sexual favors from the female customers. <laughs> Based. After a few hours of riding with him, my enthusiasm for the job was pretty much shot, and the darkness I received from him stayed with me during my three and a half years at Domino's. So basically what happens is Jason and this other dude is training him get into a car. Jason goes full Ned Flanders on the guy and is like, I am so excited to share the word of the Lord and deliver Domino's pizza to all the great residents of Athens, Georgia. And the guy looks at him and is like, dude, we're making four bucks an hour. And like, I'm happy if I get a blowjob from one of the chicks I deliver to. And then for the next three and a half years, Jason hated Domino's Pizza. That's what happened. That's what I've read. The person who trained me had a great habit of making me feel worthless with constant remarks of how he was a better driver than me and how I couldn't drive worth a lick. He saw it as friendly joking, but there were times it dug a little too deep. So... Throwing it back to the very first blog post I read here, and how Jason would write that everyone's been against him since 2004 and been driving Nazi cars on NASCAR to push him over the edge because he's Jewish. This is another one of those situations where, like, and the guy who's training him is just like, yeah, it's fucking Domino's. Like, this isn't this isn't a difficult place to work at. It's just delivering pizza. Just go where the address says. Jason interpreted that as this guy being like out to get him and against him and ruining his life. And made him hate Domino's. Which is very strange because at the same time Jason is like just shilling the fuck out of Domino's on his YouTube streams. So like he hates Domino's pizza from like the first day he started working there. And he still like made it part of his like identity. Every time he said he was a better driver than me I would kindly say I don't doubt that you are. Okay. Okay. He came over to try my simulator, and of the dozens of people who tried it, he was the only person who experienced motion sickness. Now that I've departed from Domino's, I'm very glad I don't have to hang around his toxicity. All the, like, that that sure showed him. Like, yeah, he tried your shitty eye racing setup and was like, wow, I kind of feel sick because that's what happens with VR. And use that as justification for, for getting out of that environment. Well, he did like my Simrig, so fuck him. Like, this, this is all this dude thinks about is, I'm going to make it to NASCAR playing NASCAR 03 and eye racing. And if someone doesn't like NASCAR or someone even remotely criticizes me, I'm going to stalk them and get them fired from their job and, and smear them online. That's what this dude does all day. Though dampened, I wasn't completely down and out. I'd walk in and see my name with 25 star reviews next to it. My managers would have a sense of wonder when it came to how many tips I received in comparison with the other drivers. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they did. One of the thorns on my side was being nervous around the people at the top of the companies I worked for, which, yeah, it's pretty normal. Even though I was super friendly to our customers, I'd lose that spirit around the corporate folks. I would become very shy and almost act like I didn't want them to be around. That goes back to my customer service voice blog, in which I feel it would have benefited me to not have these strange afflictions occur on me. So basically in one of his other blogs, which I haven't included in here because it's not that interesting, he just talks about how like he, he puts on this like fake persona around customers to get good reviews on Google on Google Maps or whatever. And it just, it's like a gift from God or something. It's its its a trip, but it's not as intense as of some of these blogs. The good side of the story, when we tell stories, we sometimes tell only the good parts. Sometimes we tell only the bad parts. Sometimes we try to explain the good and bad parts of the story. There are two sides to every story. Plenty of bad things happened while I worked for Domino's, and there were some pretty funny things that happened there too. But to some of the good of it all, I'd have to say this. I met the gentleman who helped me get in touch with my sim chassis builder. My carbon fiber seat prayer was answered while working there. I displayed the kind of customer service I would show to fans and the extra miles I would go to represent sponsors if given the opportunity. I met God-given connections that will resurface as my years play out. I learned the importance of healthy eating. Blessings to all the fo- all the who find the good uh, in this story, uh, who have the upper wisdom to know that good and bad are both part of the plan, and who know that we are being worked with by an upper hand. So, like... Even as he's working at Domino's, like, this is really all he can think about. He's like, well, Domino's sucked, but, like, this sim chassis I blew 30 grand on, I, I, I met, you know, I, I met that guy through working at Domino's. Like, just every single thing has to be connected back to NASCAR. Like, when he's going on pizza deliveries, he's like, hey, those streets had NASCAR names. That's cool. This dude's, like, 30 years old. 
Now we get into some heavy shit. So we'll take the Domino's background off for a bit. Entry 14 of 18 that we're going to go through here. It's called Every Penny Should Be Paid. And this is where this blog gets really disturbing. And again, I reiterate that when I try and show people this and they go, oh, it's just like scripture and shit. No, there's some weird shit in here. So this one's called Every Penny Should Be Paid, and it came out around Christmas time. So he writes, his mother says, you're going to cost this family every cent we have in lawyer's fees. Jacoby responds with, you should lose everything you have because you sent me to a school with bullies. You didn't listen to me when I asked for a racing career. You sent me to mental homes when you were having breakdowns. You and dad, in quotations, <laughs> treated me harshly and pressured me into situations I didn't want to be in. So, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, the whole, you're going to cost this family every cent we have in lawyer fees. Obviously, he's had to hire a criminal defense lawyer uh, due to his charges of battery and aggravated stalking. And it, it's a mess for them. It really is a mess because with his whole YouTube shenanigans and his like just online social media shenanigans, it's very hard to defend what he's been doing from like a criminal justice standpoint. I mean, my man's going on YouTube and making videos like, I, you know, like, come against Joni Axon and kill her. Or, you know, Osnogonoski should be taken down. Or, I wish death to everyone in that family except for my son. You know, like, he's he's going he, he's going really intense there. And that's very hard in the legal system to defend. So, Jason is trying to argue that, actually, this is all part of the plan. And that Jason is intentionally misbehaving and might even be self-aware this entire time. So all these schizo YouTube videos he's made, uh, intentionally getting into trouble, intentionally making threats towards other uh, towards other people just around the city, and of course now crossing crossing international borders. These aren't just the ramblings of a schizo madman. He might actually be doing this on purpose, and I'm I'm that's how I've interpreted this. That he's intentionally trying to sink his family financially by just acting out and forcing him to blow money on their lawyer fees. Because it's like this very long game of revenge against his parents. So he actually wants people to sue him. He wants charges to get pressed on him and, and for his parents to blow a bunch of money trying to defend him. Because in, in his eyes, it's it's a long game. And it's revenge for how they supposedly treated him growing up. And... This treatment includes sending him to school with bullies, which there are bullies at every school. Like, it happens, but it sucks, and I get it. And I feel for him in some regard, because if even part of that story is true, which it might not be, bullies suck. But this is... This is... This is a bit too overkill. You didn't listen to me when I asked for a racing career. Well, the, the odd part is, as we covered in earlier blog posts, and this is kind of why I structured them in the exact se sequence that I did, he did have a street stock. He did have, you know, a crew of people willing to work on his car for him. He pissed everybody off. He kept having, like, schizo outbursts. So, like, people didn't even want to, like, work on his car anymore. And again, you'll have to rewind on the VOD to the first few blog posts, but, like, again, he did have a street stock. He did try and race at a track that is moderately populated in Georgia, not just like a butt, you know, a butt fuck bullring with like five cars. He, first of all, they bought a shitty car that broke on them all the time. And, uh, when his like brothers and his, you know, his relatives would work on the car for him and like actually try and get it, get it off because like he did have some success in sim racing and he was trying to make the jump. He would scream at them and have like schizo outbursts. And they were like, Oh yeah, we're not going to do this. So he still feels that he was wronged by that, even though in other blog posts he says that, like, actually it was his fault and he was kind of a cunt. So, I don't know what's going on here. You sent me to mental homes when you were having breakdowns. That's really debatable. I mean, as we've seen uh, from this, from the other blog posts, including the one where he talks about court-mandated injections, uh, he was outright talking about, like, hey, like, I'm in some serious shit, and, like, I was admitted to a psych ward against my my will. And I was put on, like, Haldol, which is a really serious, you know, like, uh, anti-psychotic medication. And for it to be court-mandated, like, there's some serious shit that has to be going on here. So for him to be blaming this on his parents, something doesn't add up here. 
Uh, and as someone in the comments <laughs> said, I mean, you, you caught this before I got there. You and dad, in quotations, treated me harshly and pressured me into situations I didn't want to be in. I'm just going to highlight this here. Dad being in quotations implies some stuff. It's odd. I don't want to go there. <laughs> but, like, putting dad in quotations means one thing. Or it typically means one thing. And and I don't think it's wrong to interpret it that way. But I would not, like, like my dad is my biological dad, and I would not, I, I would not put my dad's name in quotations. I would not write Brent in quotations. There's one reason you'd do that. <laughs> so, of course, Jason actually has comments enabled on the site, and a couple of people are just like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> right? Like, Eric John Katozzi is, is Mr. Based here. You're an idiot. Yeah, that's about right. So, so again, this blog post almost kind of implies that he's intentionally getting himself into trouble to be malicious and, and to enact revenge against his family, who are trying to do the right thing by paying uh, for a criminal defense lawyer. But he's intentionally sabotaging their efforts just, just to get back at them, which is, it, it, oh my god, what, what a fuck. So we move on to blog post number 15. Gridding the Invisible Path. This is interesting. And again, this was posted 8-16-2021, two weeks ago. Not too long ago, things began to correlate in every aspect of life. The grid lines began to appear when I'd wake up and rise from my bed sometimes. My mom had been talking about crying Elijah and the crystalline grid. I don't know any of these things, and I went to a Catholic school. So so reading this is just a, a fuck for me. Cry on, to my knowledge, is one of those speakers who helps her rise to her higher self. My mom believes that we create our own destinies, but she can't even get it over her own anxiety and dark nights of the soul. I hope to see my mom happy one day, and I'm not here to bash her, rather. I'm here to share a story about the grid of life. But I'm going to share personal experiences within this blog post, too. And, and he, he really he really doesn't talk about the grid of life. It's just a story about his mom. <laughs> psychology books in the storage unit. I was helping my mom move stuff around in the storage unit, and I saw about six boxes full of psychology books. Seeing this brought back or brought me back to a very dark time within my own mental storage unit. It reminded me of how my mother would take my little brother and I to family therapy when I was maybe five years old. Interesting, dad, in quotations, is not written anywhere near here. It created a stigma that there was something wrong with us. I asked my mom why family therapy was such a big deal to her when going to these sessions was something that actually depressed me. Her response was, we have to fix every issue in this family. This is actually quite sad because it sounds like his mom, even though she had like her own screws loose, she kind of recognized that like, Something was very wrong very early on, and like she was trying, so she really did try, and it, the, the wheels just came off. In my young eyes, as old my brothers, who hardly even remembers this, there wasn't anything wrong. My mom was just making up problems that didn't exist and forcing us to solve a problem that she had created. Again, it dad in quotations mixed with this, it, it gives interesting undertones. But it does sound like she had some awareness that, like, my son, my eldest son is, is a mess. This is not going to play out well, and, like, I need professional help. And it sucks because it just didn't work. But this is where things get really wild. Nowadays, she apologizes and says that's just the way we thought back then. When she says we, she's talking about the adults and psychologists who make up problems when there really aren't any. My mom doesn't believe I'm mentally ill anymore. She's woken up to the fact that so many commercials exist to make you believe you have some type of disorder. Last night, Davina and I were talking about the power of advertising when it comes to things like Wendy's commercials on TV. I just, I just, I just want to go over this again. My mom doesn't believe I'm mentally ill anymore. I have questions. I have a lot of questions. I, I, I mean... Your kid is your kid is writing schizo nonsense on his blog like sometimes three times a day, and thinks Dale Jr. is communicating with him through special messages in his podcasts. And your mom doesn't believe you're mentally ill. I just I just have questions. I have a lot of questions. I say this over and over because one of the biggest life lessons is repetition. 
when I see another go-kart in my path of the local karting tracks, I think of how God has placed it there. In like manner, he has put a path for me to get around that cart, and I can only follow the predestined path. In the internal and mental sense, this is the same for emotions. God will put certain emotions in your mind, leading you down the path he desired. It's an invisible grid on which we travel, just like the wire map you see when painting cars in Paint Shop Pro or Photoshop. Oh my goodness. This is a fucking ride. Oh wow, that's an interesting person to show up in our chat. Hello, Mr. Land. Greetings from, I believe you're in Florida right now, or you're on your way there. Hey Austin, have you ever actually talked to Jacoby before? I mean, like an actual direct conversation over voice chat? No. Never. I think I had the brief Facebook interaction I did with uh, with him earlier in 2020, where he just like asked for my address. But yeah, I think David's got a pretty good grasp on the situation. Like, this, this is going to be some Chris Chan shit, and I just... Oh, I hope it gets dealt with. So, there are two things to address here. We've gone over one where the mom says she doesn't believe uh, he's mentally ill anymore, which is just interesting. That's that's an interesting stance to take. But I think people probably missed Davina here. Who is Davina? So, what kicked off most of this, like, Jacoby horse shit in the sim racing community is that, like, his girlfriend slash baby mama slash chat moderator. Uh, obviously, she eventually got away from him and got sole custody of their kid. So, Davina is his new girlfriend. So, like, this guy is, like, out of money, delusional, believes he's going to get recruited into NASCAR. Uh, is writing on his blog, schizo nonsense every day. Uh, he's, like, I believe he's the guy behind trying to hack into mine and other people's accounts. In sim racing, there's been a lot of account breaches. I think we're up to 11 now between myself and, and the others where someone from the Atlanta, Georgia area has tried to bust into their address. Or not their address, sorry, but like their online accounts. So like, he's got all this shit going on. He's got himself a new girlfriend. And meanwhile, he's... There's like... He, he's already had a child and he... You know, he, he has he has nothing to do with it. Like that that's really the crazy part of reading this blog is like this this reads like a fifteen or sixteen year old who's just like obsessed with NASCAR and is just like kinda schizo. But then you realize this dude's like thirty years old and like has a kid and like ha has nothing to do with the kid. And like while he's writing this shit and and just being like a schizo on his blog, there's like, you know, a, a whole family that's been like affected by this guy. And, like, have been really messed up by him. And Davina is that girl. It's someone I believe he met either at Planet Fitness or possibly the Psych Ward, which... YOLO. Hashtag YOLO. But... Like, it, it's really crazy to me that, like... <laughs> my man has a girlfriend while writing this shit, you know? Like... Some someone somewhere is is making sense of all of these ramblings and is like, yeah, you should move in with me, bud, and you can like be my like live-in boyfriend and we can just like you know like do things together. While he's like writing the schizo nonsense and and you think you think this blog post was bad about life being just like the the wireframe in Photoshop, we're gonna go to Trump's toilet and Biden's bathroom. This is my personal favorite blog post, uh, because this is this is some shit. Both both. Both figuratively and, uh, what's the other one? Not, not, or I, I should just say not just figuratively. You can tell it's 1am. So there is a spirit of seriousness regarding politics and leaders of the world, but I often think of how everyone uses the bathroom. At the podium, you have a man or woman who poops and pees. In the audience, you have members who poop and pee. And from those humans in the audience, insults are hurled out of their mouths and into the ears of the man or woman at the podium. God created the bowels, and he, he, in, in, in caps, created the spirits, especially the spirit of seriousness. And of course, God created man, of, man and woman. And so we shall go, as is prophesied about us, attacking one another until God's good-feeling spirits are brought forth and put into all people. Yeah. So, so my man often thinks about how you take a shit, and how I take a shit. 
and how David Land takes a shit. And how Trump and Biden both take shits. This man is 32 years old and has a son that he doesn't see, that he doesn't pay for, and, and is living with his girlfriend right now, who is just totally on board with all of this. And the entire community that he lives in like knows this guy's office rocker and is probably going to hurt someone in the future, and has already potentially hurt someone in the past. I know we got to wait for the justice system, system to play out, but like, you don't just get randomly charged with battery. Yeah. This this is this is some actual literal shit right here. My man is is constantly obsessed with the fact that people shit. That's it. That full stop. That's that's it. Jason Jacoby thinks about you pooping. I'm I'm not I'm not saying anything that's a lie. It says it right here. So this is this is this is wild. And again, like it's because his blog is not accessible you have, you have to manually type in the address this is just wild it's really wild this is something almost nobody knows about but like myself and a couple others who again have to monitor him to see what his mental state is in and you know to archive it for the police and all that horse shit we've been watching this for like almost a year now these just wild posts So, some days I wake up in the morning and I check Jason's blog and see that, yep, I he's fantasizing about Joe Biden taking a dump. And he's probably thinking about me dump, taking a dump, too. It, it's great. Two posts left. This one's called A Fresh Attitude on Money. Davina and I usually acknowledge that God gives us money when he needs us to have it. It isn't necessarily something that we need, but it's something he'll provide us when he needs us to have it. Again, like, my man spent years, like, introducing people, uh, introducing people to who Mackenzie was, and posting on, you know, his, his Facebook page, being like, oh my god, you know, we're having a baby and starting a family together, and making her a part of his Discord channel, and, and introducing people to her on YouTube as, as his chat moderator, and, you know, the girl working the cameras, and this, uh, how do I put this? He he really made a tangible effort to like start a life with this woman and like include her in a lot of shit. And now that she's run away, like it really hasn't sunk into him that like this is actually just pretty serious fuck that you're in. You know, like you have a you're a thirty one or thirty two year old man with with a young child that you're not paying for that uh you don't see that you're not allowed to see and you are going on your blog and just expecting people to understand that you have a girlfriend now after everything you know like you're you're being charged with a couple of different crimes that are extremely serious you know in terms of battery and aggravated stalking like you you can't just those are, don't just get slapped on people you know that's not how the police work you're in some really serious shit, and it comes after years of, like, trying to make this girl, like, a part of your brand and your identity, both online and, and off. And then you just go and you write about how you and your random girlfriend that you picked up from Planet Fitness are poor. It's an odd flex, and it's it's probably the most disturbing part of this, because, like, there's a kid in Georgia now who, like, this is his dad, and it's really fucked up, and, and there's, a, there's a young mom in Georgia who's like 22, 23 years old, who's having to raise a kid, and, and this, is, this is the dad. And she's going to have to explain this to the kid when he, when he comes of age one day, that like, your dad was some like esports schizo who, just years after you were born, like fucked off to live in some like really poor part of Gainesville, Georgia. To, to sit around begging Dale Earnhardt Jr. to recruit you into NASCAR and telling people on your blog that you were poor, you know? Like, it's it's really sad and just fucked up. And it's really disturbing. You wouldn't exist if you were necessary for God's plan. Beyond money, you were given what you need when you were needed to receive it. This includes everything like thoughts, feelings, food, knowledge, wisdom, spiritual powers... Every time you've ever had a thought run across your mind, it was put there trillions of years before you came to be. Every emotion, every person, every instinct, everything. This has nothing to do with anything, really. 
from what Catholic Kavanaugh has written in the chat, how old was Jacoby and how old was his baby's mom when she gave birth? I believe, from what I've talked to Kenzie about, I believe she was underage when she was pregnant, but she was of age when she had the baby, but I'm not particularly sure. But I know that it's a problem. And I know that someone left a comment on one of my YouTube videos saying that, like, she had known Mackenzie in high school and that, like, it might not have been legal. It, like, it was, it was a, it was a problem. But again, it's, the whole situation, even without the kid, like, even regardless of whether, whether she was of age or underage, the fact that, like, you know, there's this young mom in Georgia trying to raise this kid, and it's, it's hard, you know, like, she, she doesn't have a career. She's still figuring things out, and she's, she's quite young, too, like, she is young. And the dad, instead of, you know, even providing for them, A, doesn't pay child support, just doesn't give a fuck, he's pretty sociopathic in that regard, and B is, like, sitting on his blog convinced that, like, some buddy he made 20 years ago on NASCAR 03, realistically that's what Junior is, is a buddy to him from NASCAR 03, is gonna recruit him into NASCAR, and is bragging about his, like, his new girlfriend on his blog but then simultaneously admitting they're both poor and can't afford anything, and then trying to justify it because it's all part of God's plan. It's it's weird, man. Like, this is, this is some shit. Now we get to the final and potentially the craziest blog post that I've read on this whole site, and it came out today. This one's called The Servant of Kroger, and uh, for those who don't know, because I actually didn't, Kroger is a grocery store chain down in the southeastern United States. Up here in Canada, like, our two major brands are Safeway and Sobeys. And, of course, you have, like, Walmart and stuff like that. But Kroger is just, like, a regional grocery store chain. Kind of like a high V. And this is, this is actually scary for me to read. Because it really shows you, like, Jason's perception of the world around him and just how batshit insane it all is and how like it's it's quite frightening for those around him because like how he experiences the world and how he interprets it is just like not not accurate so this was posted 8 22 2021 basically a couple hours ago i was wandering down a different path on the way home from the library and i was wondering why god took me off of my regular path so just him walking home and just going a different route it's just that's god's plan too Save on is shit, Mr. Kavanaugh. <laughs> I hate fucking save on. Never go there. But anyway, like, this dude goes a slightly different way home from work one day. And, like, that's... Oh, I have a no frills right by my house, too. I, I can't stand no frills. Jason goes a slightly different way home from work. Or from the library. And is like, that's part of God's plan. Like, everything is it has to have a higher meaning has to have some, like, schizo-nonsense associated with it, which is just not good. Surely there's a reason for my delay, I thought, because this new path was longer, which is why I liked it anyway, because a longer path equates to more steps on less and less fat on the belly. So always looking for deeper meaning, meanings in just, like, random, mundane activities. So on my way home, on my new way home, John Redcorn in a Jeep pulls up to one of the intersections and says, dude, hop in while he's blasting 80s rock. Jason didn't actually write that. I just, that's what I imagined it. So John Redcorn, which is actually his friend named Joel from Planet Fitness, uh, I had been thinking about him a couple of days earlier because he's a really good friend I was introduced to when I worked there. He and I shared the same background in the Worldwide Church of God and its offshoots and splinters. I was not baptized in any WCG offshoots, but it's where I was led for a lot of biblical truth. I've never heard of any of this. Even though I had just over a mile to go, I figured that God would let me get those fat-burning steps in another time. Joel drove me home and offered me his Chevy Cavalier for 500 bucks. Based. I'm, I'm supportive of this. If it's between an 03 or an 05 model year, you have the Ecotec 2.2 engine, which is what's in my mini stock on the left there. And they're beastly motors, and they're fucking sick, and they explode, but up until they explode, they're awesome. So, so based. I'm fully supportive of Joel giving him his Cavalier, as long as it's between the 03 and 05 model year. So the Cavalier definition is a horseman, especially a mounted soldier, 
or a knight, one having the spirit or bearing of a knight, a courtly gentleman, gallant. So, like, his buddy gives him his, like, rusted out shit box, which is hopefully an 03 to 05 Cavalier. And he, like, looks at the car's name and interprets it to be about himself and, like, a gift from God <laughs> that that this precise car model with this precise name was given to him. Okay. It's funny because after I'd written this post on Domino's the other day, I kept remembering the Black Cavalier of that unnamed trainer. And a couple of days before meeting Joel on my walk, I'd been watching Jeff Cavallari's videos on YouTube. He does athlete cross fitness videos. So just, this is this is quite common in Jacoby's recent posts. He, he tries to equate so much random shit as all being interconnected with one another. So, like, it's it's very schizo. It's, it's a trait of schizos. It's like, well, I have this car named, Ca- named a Cavalier, but I also, also watched uh, uh, Jeff Cavallari's videos, and the, the meaning of, of Cavalier is... It means a knight, and the knight has the same traits as me, and and and, and you can tell he's got like this bullet board of like thumbtacks and and like sticky notes and and all kinds of shit like connecting it, and it's all connected, man. That's that's he he does this a lot. So I've been borrowing my brother's Silverado for the past few months, and even funnier is that I brought back Joel's Cavalier on the exact same day that my brother needed his truck back. I went to Mister, which is like. Probably a car detailing place. Detailed my brother's truck, filled up the tank, and brought the Cavalier back to get its Mister membership. So, fun fact: I also drive a Silverado. So, my my man's my man's a Chevy guy through and through, and I I respect I respect the bow tie just like he does. I I think that's pretty based. <laughs> the last funny thing about the Cavalier I just purchased was the fact that it's missing the driver's side mirror. Before even seeing the car, I kept getting visions of my Dodge Avenger, which was also missing the driver's side mirror. Thoughts kept coming to my mind. Will this car be missing its driver's side mirror as well? The Cavalier had a lot of loose change in it, as well as a bunch of other stuff that needed to be disposed of when I had gotten to the car wash. More work to do was fun, so I enjoyed the process of cleaning the car. (laughs) Jeffy FF, so what you're saying is because I own a Golf R and I live near a golf course, I'm going to win the Masters, yeah? You win. (laughs) You're a moderator for the evening. I like that. <laughs> that's fucking incredible. <laughs> but yes, that's that's how a lot of his blog posts have been. And you also notice, like, as he goes through this post, he has to over-explain, like, the smallest detail. Like, oh, I had to clean the Cavalier. And then he has to explain that it's okay I had to cl- cl- uh, clean the Cavalier because more work to do is fun. So I enjoyed the process of cleaning the car. And then when he explains why uh, he took a new path home, he's like, well, I liked it anyway, because a longer path equates more steps and less fat on the belly. And then he has to explain who Jeff Cavallari is. Oh, he does athlete and cross fitness videos. Like, just additional details (laughs) that you just don't need. He just continuously interjects. Cleaning is fun, because I have to clean the car. A longer path home means less fat on the belly. Like, just over and over again. Like, bro, I don't give a fuck. Even even the paragraph about, hey, it's missing the driver's side mirror, just like my Dodge Avenger. That's so cool. It's all connected, bro. Like, stop. <laughs> Fucking stop. So, I decided to go home and get a Ziploc bag to put all the change in so that I could have, or, have it organized for the Coinstar machine. The coins from the Cavalier, however, had a bunch of grease from the tobacco products and junk that I was cleaning out of the car. Notice how he doesn't say, like, dip or chew or, like, just, like, cigarettes. It's tobacco products. Like, very formal. I figured I would probably jam the Coinstar machine, but it was worth a try to get some more money. <laughs> yeah, it's... This starts going off the rails really quick. This is this is where it, it's just, what the fuck, man. So, Jason writes, I had a number in my head of $20, thinking that would be the perfect amount of money to receive. As I was at the Coinstar machine, a man walked up to the lottery machine next to me. I smiled at him, and he walked off after purchasing his ticket. Up next came a lady who nudged me and handed me a $20 bill. 
so just my man is just like at like the coin exchanger of like some shitty car wash and this this lady just walks up to him and gives him 20 bucks I don't think this happened just just straight up I don't think this happened there like I've gone to like ATMs like hundreds of times in the 711 people do not approach me and are like hey you're you, you seem like a man of god like here's 20 bucks for your groceries just as she handed me the $20, the Coinstar machine jammed. She looked at me and said, you were blessed and highly favored by God. I do not think any of this happened. I don't think the Coinstar machine jammed. I don't think this woman gave him 20 bucks. I don't think the woman looked at him and said, you are blessed and favored by God. I just, none of this happened. Just straight up, none of this happened. Like, I would, I bet like, I bet my mini stock that none of this happened. At all. I thanked her so much for the $20, asking if she was sure I should have it. I told her, even if I cannot bless you myself, if you do a good deed for a, do for a good person, the Most High will bless you himself. Okay. This, this is a totally real conversation that happened between two totally sane people in small town Georgia. Yes. We hugged, and she walked off. I went to the customer service desk to notify the attendant that I had jammed the Coinstar machine. We ended up throwing most of the change away once she opened the machine because it was full of grease that wouldn't let the machine read it. Change does not get that dirty in a car. Like, it, it doesn't. It really doesn't. I followed the customer service lady back to the desk and got to the back of the line to cash out the $2 that the machine was able to process before it had jammed. Some, something is just not right about this story. Like, so, he, he, here's a question. He finds... The Cavalier had a lot of loose change in it. Okay, that's fine. Loose change implies money. Why does he need to put it into the Coinstar machine? Why can't he just go to, like, the cashier... And be like, yo, can I get can I get change for this? Like, can, can I like I have a bunch of quarters. Can I can you give me like a loony for it? Like, I don't know. Fuck, like I I I don't have a ton of change, but like, if I had four quarters, I could go up to my my fucking you know like cashier anywhere and be like, yo, I have I have four quarters. Can I have a loony? This is inconvenient for me, please. So, like, he already has the money, and, and he goes to the Coinstar machine instead, but the Coinstar machine can't read the coins because they're greasy. But as, as the people, like, as Jeff, Jeffy FF writes, coin machines don't work like that. It's based on the weight of the coin, and there's no way a coin could be too greasy for this story. So, like, this whole story is just, like, weird and bullshit. It, it, reads, like, it reads like the intro of, like, Freddy Got Fingered. You know, where, like... Freddy's parents are like, hey, we got you a bus ticket, you know, so we can send you on your big trip and we'll meet you at the bus station. And they drive to the bus station in, in, in separate vehicles. And then at the bus station, they're like, actually, Freddy, no, we got you a car. You can you can have, like, the Chrysler. But but they bought him a bus ticket beforehand, so, like, why not give him the car before making him go to the bus ticket station, or the bus station? What the fuck? Like, it's the same thing. Like, you have the money. Just, just go, just go to, go to, the, my head hurts. We'll just move on. <laughs> As I was standing in line, I kept praying for the lady who had blessed me, because this is, this is totally normal to do at Save on Foods or, or at Safeway. Like, I mean, that's just, that's what happens too. Like, when someone pays for my food or is nice to meet McDonald's, like, I go, I immediately go to Sobeys and, and stand in the chip aisle and pray for her, you know? So I prayed that God bless her so much, and if he ever allows me to in the future, that he would let me bless her financially as well. As I was silently praying these prayers, I began to get visions of her having Coca-Cola in her cart. Okay. So my man is like, wow, some lady just randomly gave me 20 bucks, which probably didn't happen, to like deal and like the coin machine 
was fucky and didn't read my coins, which also probably didn't happen because those, those, that's not how those machines work. And his response after these two completely made up scenarios is to go to the grocery store and, and stand in the chip aisle and pray for this random girl that he probably didn't meet. And now he's getting visions of this non-existent person drinking Coca-Cola soft drinks. And that triggers him because he doesn't want to promote unhealthy food. <clears throat> and he even writes, you know that I'm anti-Coca-Cola because they poison their customers instead of using their resources to create the purest water for all people suffering from unclean drinking water. And he links to charity water. After receiving these visions, which translation are, are schizo delusions, I asked God for a polite way to talk about the damaging effects of Coca-Cola. God may use me to help influence soda companies to make pure water for all the people of the earth. And then I considered tracking her down in the store to talk to her about it, knowing our footsteps are ordered. So, I don't even know what to say at this point. Like, this lady might have existed, she might not have existed, but now, like, my man's having schizo visions in the chip aisle at fucking Walmart, and is like, I have to go track down this lady who randomly handed me a $20 bill and and talk to her about the dangers of Coca-Cola because this, this lady needs to know about this even though there's like no proof this lady existed in the first place. So my man's just having a bit of a moment in the chip aisle. <laughs> and we're not even done yet. <laughs> As the customers in front of me had an issue that was taking some time to solve... I kept praying feverently in my mind. All of a sudden, I got another nudge from behind. The lady whom God used to bless me had just handed me another $20. <laughs> what the fuck? <coughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So, I I don't know what part of the story is bullshit. So, let, let's say all of this is true. And that this random lady came up to him and had him a $20 bill because the coin machine couldn't read perfectly clean coins. So he goes he goes and walks around the store for a bit and has a bit of a moment in the chip aisle. And he's like, hey, I gotta pay for my shit and like go home at some point. And then... He, he, he then says this lady tracks him down in the store. And is like, here's another $20. Just, just out of nowhere. She encouraged me to step out of line and told me to start shopping so that she could buy my groceries for me. I told her she'd already done so much for me and that I've been praying that God will bless her and that I could also bless her in the future. Oh, oh my goodness. Like, bros, this is a ride. And I have a bonus one for you coming up. I promise. This... <laughs> There's just, yeah, I don't even know what to say. Like, so this magical lady, when he's trying to get change at the coin machine that he didn't actually need because he could have just got change from the cashier, this lady randomly hands him a 20 bucks at like this car wash. And then he like sits in the store, like freaking out, being like, I have to track her down and, and warn her about the dangers of Coca-Cola. And, and then... He's like, no, no, I can't. I, I have to pay for my shit and go the fuck home because like this has already been a, a trip. Like I, I got picked up by my buddy and he made me buy him his buy his old Cavalier and like this this is just so this is intense, man. This has like multiple like chapters of this this little blog post. And then she fucking tracks him down at the grocery store and gives him another twenty bucks and is like, I'll buy your groceries. Like damn. I go I got out of the customer service line and no, it's just it's just the till, my man. And picked up some avocados from the produce section. I like how produce is capitalized. Like it's holy to him. Like you know, you notice. I don't know if you guys can see, but he'll capitalize like God. He'll capitalize like he when referring to God. Produce is capitalized, so uh, I think he he seen he deems this to be important. I went and got some Amy's organic soups from the soup aisle. I didn't want to buy a lot, but she encouraged me to put more and more into the cart. She admired how healthy I was eating, and I told her about how God gave Daniel and his friends more knowledge and wisdom since they decided to take care of their temples by eating vegetables and, and water. This is definitely a conversation that occurred at the supermarket. Definitely. 
Like, this is 100% a normal exchange that happens at the supermarket that doesn't end in the cops getting called. We talked scripture over and over, and all of a sudden the numbers 49 and 53 kept coming to my mind. If you've read other blogs on here, you'll know those numbers are significant to me. They actually aren't. I've, I've read all the other blogs. The most significant numbers are usually like 3, 8, and 15, because those are all the old DEI numbers uh, from when uh, Junior drove for the Bud Car and all that shit. Those numbers mean fucking nothing. It, it, like, I'm, I, I don't think they talk scripture over and over. I don't think she gave him twenty dollars. I don't think she gave him a second twenty dollars. I don't think this person existed. My man is having like a mass schizo delusion at the grocery store, and it's rough. Also, her cart was mostly full of Coca Cola products and processed foods. She had four six packs of Coke bottles as well as other sugary products. I kindly told her of the health benefits I experienced by not consuming those products. So he he did warn her about Coca-Cola. This is just wild. As we headed to checkout, she encouraged me to get back in the line and cash my $2 in from the Coinstar machine. I did that as she went to ring our, our cars at the self-checkout. As soon as I stepped up to, to cash my Coinstar receipt... The lady in front of me's transaction popped up just one number on the screen. 49. This didn't happen either. Guarantee it. This did not happen. Like, bro, I was talking scripture with this bitch at the supermarket who just gave me like 20 bucks over and over again. And I just kept like fixating on the numbers 49, 53. And then I got to the till. And the person in front of me had a grand total of $49 exactly. This didn't happen. None of this happened. None of this is real. <laughs> my man needs to be put in a home please help <laughs> I cashed in my two dollars went over to meet my new friend at the self checkout she had already bagged my order of organic vegetables and avocados and told me that she'd put my receipt in the bag we left each other when we got outside and said god bless to each other this didn't happen she told me that she's my new Kroger mom in case I ever see her there again Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Is this a thing? Is this a thing? Dude, sugar daddies are so 2020. I want a Kroger mom. I just... I I, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I just... I want a Kroger mom. This is some shit, man. Like... I can't believe, like, honestly, I read the first half of this, so I didn't, I didn't spoil it for myself. This is the first time I'm reading this, too. This is unbelievable. I, guys, I have no words for this. Yeah, it's a thing. When I looked at the receipt in big, bold numbers, the savings listed were 49 cents. This is unbelievable. This didn't happen. I guarantee you this didn't happen. When working cashier jobs in retail stores, some ladies would claim me as their son due to the kindness God has given to me. Okay. Sure. 100%. I'm sure they do. She had checked out a register 503 and the total was 5134. I was born at 513 p.m. in Arizona. Are you sure it's register 503? Because, like, usually when I, like, go shopping just anywhere, tills are numbered from, like, 1 to 25, or, like, starting at 1. <laughs> Step 1, you need to walk home a different way. Step 49, you get a Kroger bomb. Like, this story is crazy. 5 plus 1 plus 3 plus 4 equals 13. Numbers are significant to God and have been a huge factor in me since early 2020. Puns intended. For more info on how another person openly told me that God led them into my life, please read this story referencing Bubba Wallace. Lastly, as a fellow human and as a fellow human being and servant of the Most High, I encourage you to go vegan. <sighs> so like this story just oh my god, this is this is more intricate than, like, some novels I've read. Like, he starts out walking his, walking just, like, a different way home from, like, 
where was he? The library? I don't know why the fuck you're at the library. Libraries are for losers. And then, like, his friend who totally isn't John Redcorn pulls up in a Jeep and who totally isn't blasting 80s rocks, says, dude, hop in. And then he sells him his Cavalier. And it's a sign from God because, like, the name Cavalier reflects his own, like, personal abilities. And then he goes and cleans out the car at the coin shop. Or not the coin shop, at, like, the bubbles or whatever the, like, the self-serve car wash is. And then he tries to get, like, cash from the Cavalier that he found lying around, exchanged at the Coinstar machine, even though he didn't need to. But then the Coinstar machine jams because there was grease on the coins, even though the coin machine doesn't work that way. We're just going to roll with it here. So then a lady hands him $20 at the grocery store. Or was it at the Coinstar? I don't fucking know. And then he goes and, like, walks around the grocery store and is like, I need to tell this person about the dangers of Coca-Cola. But then he can't find her, so he just says, fuck it. And then he goes and stands in line, the lady finds him and gives him another $20 for groceries. And then they talk about scripture. And then she becomes his Kroger mom. Because that's a thing. And then he just randomly starts having visions of these two completely random numbers that have nothing to do with anything. 49 and 53. And then he sees them all at the checkout till. And then he adds up all the numbers and they add up to 13. And he was born at 5.13pm in Arizona. And that was his day. This is incredible. We're not done yet. We got one more. So this one's called... Race and Jason is not racist, Jason. Trustee in jail. So this one came out in the middle of the summer when he first started getting on to, uh... What's it called? His, 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 uh... Back to his blog after, like... This is after, like, months of not posting anywhere. He was, he was, uh... What's the word I'm looking for? He was in jail for a few months. He got out. He abstained from posting anywhere online. This is this is pretty wild ride too. So he's he had just got back to posting on his blog after uh, a couple months of being out of action and just kind of laying low. This is one of his first posts. It's called "Race and Jason is not racist, Jason, trustee in in jail." So this came out seven twelve twenty twenty one, just at the start of this summer. One of the most bogus attacks I've received about my God-given character is that I'm a racist. Growing up in Arizona, I was raised to idolize African-American people. That was the term we used, although my friends over the years often prefer that I start describing their different skin colors black, brown-skinned, or bronze. Okay. Black people were a rarity where I grew up in Arizona, and I had only two black classmates until I entered the 8th grade. I admired them for their athletic ability and strength, and Marcus and his little brother were always friends while I attended school with him. Okay. Over the years, I've had best friends like Tanner Williams, William Armstrong, George Gibbs, Claudia, and Davina. Just name a few of the closest friends I've had. People who aren't liars and slanderers can read my spirit very easily. I'm extremely friendly to everyone. Yeah, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Though God brings friends in and out, I've always had friends from different ethnic backgrounds, skin tones, or colors. Okay. When I was in jail, most of the inmates were brown-skinned. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> You can't say that. <laughs> Uh-oh. You, you No, you can't say that, my man. Like Uh Yeah. <laughs> That's an odd one. And I would have loved for my accusers to see how much brotherly love took place with my friends of a different color. <sighs> oh. That uh, yeah, it's awkward, man. I gave my socks and shirts away to those who asked for them, food to those without commissary, and time to those who needed it. My friend Marcus Strong asked to borrow one of my Bibles, and when he returned it, it was sitting at Psalm 109. <clears throat> okay. I don't I don't know why you were giving, like, socks and shirts to people. Like, I, I, I just... This is not a problem. Jail provides you with clothes. 
I can never thank Corporal Wright enough for the discernment to move me to trustee. Praise to God for giving him that. I was what many officers and inmates were describing as too nice because I gave away most of my commissary that my mother and brother had sent me money for while I was in jail. Oh my, oh no. Oh no, Jason. So, commissary basically works where you can, like, a, th a third party outside can essentially send you money to be spent on shit inside the jail, like different meals and stuff. Like, it's its, it's own ecosystem. You don't sit and rot. <laughs> you don't sit and rot in a cell. You, it's its like its own little town, right? So, like, his mom and his brother are sending him... Uh, what's it called? Like, like cash, basically, to use in jail so he can, like, provide for himself and, like, have things to read and... And, like, meals to eat and stuff like that. And I, I'm seeing the comments rolled in, like, and I'll obviously, I'll obviously get to them. But, like, he's saying that, like, his parents were sending him money so, like, he could actually have somewhat, like, okay privileges in jail and not have a shitty time. And he's like, yeah, I just straight up gave it all away to just, like, other random fucks in there. Yeah, I'm again. The comments are the comments are kind of cluing in. Like, yeah, it sounds like they took his stuff. Jeff's got another good one. Hey guys, I'm totally not racist, but the jail I was in was not very white. <laughs> it's the the whole thing is is odd, man. Like, yeah, it it really does sound like he got got jumped a few times. I mean, we'll never know, right? But who knows? It just if 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 his word is to be taken at face value, which I mean, based on the last post, we're not. I don't really trust that anymore. I mean, like his parents are, his mom and his brother are sending him money so he doesn't have a shitty time, and like he's just like giving it to just like, like random like violent criminals in there. It's just what a mess. <laughs> like what the fuck? I don't even know where to start on that. There are over 300 inmates in jail and only 14 inmates get to become a trustee. Everyone who gets it is an inmate who has served time before and not been a nuisance and is only done by requesting it through the jail's kiosk system. Unbeknownst to me, Corporal Wright, a black officer, like he just, he has to point that out, just so happened to be in the unit I was in while giving, while I was giving some of my food away to black inmates and he took note of it. <laughs> like it's just, it's so ridiculous. It's like... He's writing on his blog that like hardly anyone reads, and he's like, "Guys, I promise I'm not racist. See, I went to I went to an almost all black jail, and and I gave away everything I own to like black people, so I'm totally not racist." It's just it's just weird and tripping over himself. It's odd, man. So yeah, I'm totally sure I'm totally certain that this corporal like saw this guy giving away giving shit away to like black inmates, and was like, "Wow, what a progressive white man! I'm gonna write that down." Like, no, I, I don't think so. Officer Shepard, I called him the Good Shepherd, was a great man who's often the guard for our unit. We had great conversations while I was in there, and he too is black. <laughs> Just everyone's black. Everyone's black in the story. He's the only white guy, and he's like, see, look, look how not racist I am. Like, yeah, I went to jail for a few months, but, like, everyone I knew was black, and everyone loved me. And I gave away everything to everybody, because I'm so not racist. God, what the fuck. On the day I got notified of trustee, he greeted me with a big smile and congratulated me on my God-given promotion. So yeah, this is part of God's plan too, is to be a trustee in jail. Okay. Sure. When he told me I'd been promoted to trustee on that day in early April, I thanked him and went to pack up my belongings as I was told, but I didn't know what a trustee was. You see, I didn't even know how to use the jail's kiosk other than for stocking up on commissary. I did not know what a trustee was nor how to apply for that position. God's favor took me there because of my good behavior. Thanks to God for the ability. And I can probably say that no one I've spoken to has ever heard of someone becoming a trustee without applying for it. So, like, this is right up there with, like, his story about the Kroger mom, who totally existed, 100%, who just, like, randomly threw money at him in the store. And then threw money at him again and bought his groceries for him and said, I can be your Kroger mom and I'm going to buy groceries for you. Yeah, that totally happened, just like, just like this happened, too. Yeah, I just randomly <clears throat> became a jail trustee. Didn't even know about it. Okay. As a trustee, I got to move to a small unit where we had more access to exercise as well as eat extra food after we got done serving food for the entire jail. 
So this this kind of goes on to his like tangents of like being this like customer service pro. Where he just like is like almost narcissistic about like how great his customer service skill is and like yeah I was working at Big Lots and then the Domino's pizza guy came in and begged me to come work for him because he knew just how great of a customer service rep I was. It's like It's like I don't think any of this happened. And as someone pointed in the chat, I think Baker7498 Sounds like they did that for his own safety. Maybe, yeah, I, I don't doubt that. As God changed my diet for one which takes care of the body, I was able to get extra veggies and boiled eggs on the days they were served. Thankfully, because of the commitment the jail has to the Islamic faith, coupled with research that pork has negative effects on the body, I was able to eat plenty of turkey sausage instead of pork. I don't, I don't even know what to say about this. But, like, this was a ride. So, like, we've gone through, I believe, 19 of the wildest blog posts. And it is getting late. But it's been about two hours. And I want to thank you guys for sitting through all this stuff. So, basically, what we've learned from this whole, I guess, reading of his, his blog. And, again, you can't find it on the site. To find these posts, I'll give you a quick tutorial for those still sticking around. You go to raceandjasonjacoby.com, you type forward slash blog, and it takes you to a hidden part of the website where all of these are posted. And uh, there's no index for them. You just have to keep scrolling through over and over again. And like, there are just hundreds of these. <clears throat> well, maybe he did write a post about the number 49. 13 is a big number for me. Dale Sr. died at the age of 49. Michael Waltrip won to start 463. Highway 49 runs through Charlotte. 4 plus 9 equals 13. 4 plus 6 plus 3 equals 13. O okay. So you can go there and read on your own. It's, again, it's a, it's, it's a pain in the ass because he doesn't have him indexed. He does kind of on the PS88 button if you go up here and scroll down. But they stop at from fast to slow. There's like five or six months of blog posts that he hasn't indexed. And like I've I've missed tons. Like there's this one, Take It From My Hands, where he says, uh, Junior and I connected. Any coincidence that one of the stigmas surrounding me in my early days of sim racing is the fact that I'm Jewish. Perhaps Junior and I were connected with me being the key placed upon his shoulder. This goes on for like pages. And just, just everything that I've covered. Like, I've, I've got the biggest ones out of the way, but you can just read at your own will, and it's it's great shit of reading. But, like, we've watched the Jacoby videos. And we're like, wow, this guy's kind of messed up. And, like, maybe he might actually hurt someone in the future. Uh, and we've watched, you know, his descent on Facebook and just some of the crazy shit he's done on, on YouTube, like in the comment section or, or whatever. The the blog, if you really take the time to go through it and find like some of the posts I have, like I often think about how much everyone poops. Right here. Th this has the potential to get really bad. Like this is someone who's who's a lot more dangerous than I think we even gave credit for in the beginning. And there are in between like him shilling, like, for here, here, for example, new meals and deals, and this dude just, like, shills for, like, random, like, vegan, like, meal orders, and, like, supplements that he takes. There's shit about, like, how shitty his street stock racing went. You just have to dig a lot. But, like, it's, the stuff on here is more intricate and, like, kind of scarier than anything he's posted on YouTube, I think. Like, he's he's begging people to harass Dale Jr. He's he's writing, like, schizo-nonsense about, like, encountering people at the store that very obviously didn't exist and claims they gave him money, which very obviously didn't happen. <clears throat> he's He's, like, slandering random people. 
He's like obsessed with Domino's Pizza. Like he's he's pissed at them, just just basically because one guy he didn't like working with. Which like we've all worked with a guy like that. We just didn't get along with for whatever reason. Like that made him hate the company and claim like the company's you know like running a whorehouse. <clears throat> Here's his uh, customer service voice where he just explains he would go into like a mode about customer service and would adapt this whole persona when like working at minimum wage jobs. He write poems. He'll he'll insert little like one or two liners. It's wild, man. We super sure he wasn't here over the weekend and crashed that new BMW Supra. Rip young tree. I saw that. You must be from Edmonton. Because my buddy sent me that. And yeah, you can just really keep going. And there's just so much to read. And so much of it, like, again, is, is hard to sift through. But if you really take the time, like, it's really scary. Here's, here's the last one. We'll end on this one so it's an even 20. A poem. This one's to me. <clears throat> and it's just worrying. And I think someone up here, let me let me read the comments. Uh, let me scroll up a bit. Someone asked a question about, like, safety. Uh, Catholic Kavanaugh writes, and this is a while back, I wonder if he actually is dangerous in regards to you, Austin. Say if you lived in Georgia instead of Canada. Yeah. Like... This is a serious, serious problem that, that we've unearthed in sim racing. That we literally had, like, a sociopath. And, like, a legit schizo who, like, didn't give a fuck about anything. Just trying to fuck with people. So here we have a poem. My strongest supporters deserve all the praise. And one day they'll receive their due accolades. For now I'll share a letter that is dedicated to my biggest online stalker. Okay. So he's already, he's written two blog posts like this. It's true God gave me knowledge of who my enemies would be. The greatest of them was Ostnogonoski. Oh god, does this rhyme? It rhymes, doesn't it? God did not give me the upper hand as I was too nice to take a stand. By going through hell, I broke out of my shell. My smile was destroyed for a little while, and he labeled it fake since he was blinded by hate. Not only was my kindness seen as fake, but he threw many mental illness accusations my way. Well, my man, like, we just read a blog post where you said, and you know what, we're going to go to it right now. Like, I didn't label you mentally ill, bud. Like, you, th th this one's on you. You know, like, lasting effects from a mental hospital. I was admitted against my will into a rehab center here in Georgia. Like, come on now. Like, I think I had a point. <clears throat> All the hate took a toll on my true mental state. You mean the one that you claimed you'd been suicidal since 2004? It's funny how someone can be so cruel, be an advocate for mental health, and be too stupid to see what he's doing to me. Along the way, I learned good things. I took care of my health by eating proper foods, and God has changed me into an advocate for people's well-being by putting off junk food and consuming only what's good. Yeah, that definitely undoes the fact that you don't pay child support. Speaking of consumption, I took care of myself by not reading his lies, even though they'd already done damage to my mind. Okay? He can lie all he wants because I'm strong enough now not to, or I'm strong enough now to respond to his taunts by writing me, by writing me a rap song. Thanks to Zach and Jesse and John Agnelli, they are three people who definitely stood with me. John Agnelli is another schizo who wrote, who not who wrote, but who made like a really crazy fucking video saying he wanted to kill like me and Mackenzie. I have that saved, and the cops have that. So, thanks, John. Agonoski does not show his face. He hides behind voiceovers that spew more hate. Come on, like you can go on my Insta and like look up who I am. It's not not hard. He whines about non-issues such as video games. All of his arguments are worthless and lame. O okay. Now I'm a poet, even though I was afraid to show it. His online campaign against me unlocked more of my destiny. He is a pawn, just like me. In the hand of God, used for a purpose, all of my suffering will not have been worthless. In 2017, his online campaign was a big factor in my suicide attempt, but God did not want me to die in that car accident. I never wanted enemies, but that is part of life. To Austin, see you later, hater. Or maybe I won't see you because you were still scared to show your face on the camera. And you're also too scared to admit that you and her had everybody fooled. Again, like... Like... 
I don't I don't know what to say other than two months removed and on a court mandated injection every month and two pills every night administered by my strict father. I'm now weighing in at over 180 pounds. I don't know what to say, bud. Like we just we just go back to these and it's like Since begin racing in sim racing in 04, I've had people fake my screen name and steal my IP. I was banned from racing in servers I'd never been in. People even start running swastikas on their cars because they know I have Jewish blood. Like, this dude is convinced everyone is out to get him. Other drivers, well known my favorite sim I racing, have faked my account on Facebook, using my profile picture and trying to replicate my style of writing. He's just, like, convinced, like, people are after him. That people are trying to destroy him. And that this has been going on since I was 12. Since I was fucking 12. <laughs> like, shit. But yeah, if you want to read this, racingjasonjacobi.com slash blogs. It's all there. It's unsorted, so you have to scroll a lot. Uh, you can click on the friends tab and see all the suspiciously very young children that he lists as his friends, which is not creepy at all for a 31, 32-year-old man. Like, hey, here's, like, my, my 10-year-old friend. You know, like... I, I, this is weird, man. Like, here are all the rednecks from Georgia who are, like, under 16. Who are all friends with me. And all the nice things they say about me. This isn't creepy at all. This is, this is never going to show up in a courtroom at all. Never. <laughs> this is wild, man. But, yeah. It's, it's, it's wild that, like, no one's really stumbled upon this. But, like, thanks for coming out, hanging out. I guess I'll end the stream now because it is almost 2 a.m. Probably worth going to better play and some Halo at this point. But, yeah, this is... This is a trip through, like, the most deranged stuff this guy's written on his blog, and, like, it's it's a fucking wild trip, man. So if you missed anything, like, go check the VOD. It'll be up eventually. And, yeah, like, shit, man, this, this is fucking wild.